How's that for a slice of fried gold? Are you think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. I'll be mad. There's a flesh wound. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Take your sticky paws off me, you damn dirty ape. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! I guess everyone's a time of one good scare. Yeah, I watched the movie twice. I watched the regular and the theatrical. And I try when I watched the the uh, or I'm sorry, the director's cut and the theatrical. But when I started watching the director's cut. I put on, there's this thing on the Blu-ray called Mother Mode. Does yours mm-hmm. have that? Uh, yeah, I saw that, yeah. And it's super weird and confusing. Way more complicated than like a special feature on a Blu-ray needs to be, you know? And even when you put on, there's, it's got like, you can you can bookmark things and it's really weird. But the, the one thing I wanted up is they have this little pop-up, like a pop-up video type thing where throughout the movie, there'll be little behind the scenes tidbits, you know? So I tried to put that on, but the way that that Blu-ray has it structured, it's so big on the screen. It's not like subtitles. It's like this big thing on the screen. And I was like, I can't watch the movie this way. Like I can't see a third of what's going on. Like You need the actual, <laughs> for the kids who don't know, like you need the actual pop-up video thing, like the little, you need the bubble sound. Yeah. Yep. yeah. <laughs> I just did it. Yeah. The bubble sound and the neon color or whatever it is. And it pops up and it's book. Pop oh, up aliens. <laughs> Michael Bean actually died in this scene. (laughs) Anyway, um, I will say this one thing, and it should be on the recording. And since we're recording, I guess it is now. This fucking book, The Futurist by Rebecca Keegan, uh, is fantastic. I I never even, you know, no disrespect to James Cameron, who we always joke. but I know you're listening, James. Um, (laughs) I never cared that much. But she writes it in such a way that it's like really interesting the yeah. entire time. It's a fantastically written book. <laughs> like it's, yeah. I'm not good at words, but she is, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> she is. She's a very good writer. Uh, Rebecca Keegan, that, that book is, I mean, we mentioned it on, I think one of either the Terminator episode or maybe one of the bonus episodes that that's kind of our main source, but it's, it is very good. It's uh, it goes all the way through avatar. I don't know if she'll do an update when the new one comes out, but uh, it, it traces his whole life and career up to avatar. She, I mean, Rebecca Keegan, it, she doesn't need us to boost her profile. She's the senior film editor at the Hollywood reporter. So she's, uh, she's doing, she did comment on, on your post about her though, the other day. Yeah, so she that was nice. yeah, she's yeah. very nice. Yeah, it's very nice. So yeah, th- that book is invaluable. It's it's been like my main source. I I try to use I try to usually use multiple sources, magazine articles and interviews and things like that, but hers has been a good like through line, especially some like behind, because she interviews a lot of people. So you get a lot of insight that you wouldn't get other otherwise. Nice. I mean, w- w- in the stuff talking about his childhood, she like is interviewing his brothers and you know like members of his family. It's very cool. Yeah. And it's not, it's not like what you'd say. I mean, I know this episode's already going to be long enough without going on about this forever, but she deserves some praise. Um, The it's not, if you had pitched me a a biography of James Cameron, I don't know that I would have cared, but it's actually just like segmented, like just, I love the way that she Mm -hmm. breaks it up into bits and it's, it's an interesting story. And uh, just the details she brings. And it doesn't read like a like a textbook, like so many of the books that I read for this show read very boring and intellectual and hers. It gets all the information there, but it's fun to read. Yeah, I think that's what I'm trying to say. It's a fun read. But anyway, well, hello and welcome to Cinema Shock. We're the podcast exploring the stories behind your favorite cult genre films. And uh, yeah, we're just uh, three, three simple men. It's not in our brains. I'm about to say that's (laughs) I'm I'm offended. (laughs) <laughs> hey you know what i've been called worse i, I uh, consider myself somewhat intelligent i mean we're three best buddies who love movies and we've been talking about movies our whole lives and we decided to put it in a podcast for we read all of this bullshit so you don't have to and that's why we're here <laughs> and uh, so we can tell you all about stuff like james cameron i'm one of your hosts gary horde i am co-host justin bishop and i'm writer comedian mr todd a davis this week we'll discover the power of an s and how to make love the Ellen Ripley way in our second installment of our series titled James Cameron, the man of tomorrow. Oh, thank you, Todd. Yeah. 
Um, I don't think I, I, I kept it for uh, somebody needs a nap, but just uh, this made me think of it, the make love the Ellen Ripley way uh, there <laughs> that one of the one star reviews I saw was a person just super pissed off because they watched the special edition of aliens and it apparently cut out the scene where Ellen Ripley was falling into the lava and an alien burst out of her chest. And I will have, you know, that's not was never aliens. But yeah, that's, I, that's um, Alien that's Three. Next, that was the yeah, that's the yeah. next movie. <laughs> but so anyway, they're mad, they're mad that a scene from a completely different movie wasn't in this. Movie. Yeah, and I just love that one, but I didn't use Man, it. Man, I, I really hate. I movies. really hate that the director's cut of Aliens cuts out the scene where Kirk and Spock have their hands up against the glass. You remember that scene in Aliens mm-hmm. in the theatrical <laughs> cut? Uh, but the director's cut is it's not there. It's very. It, I mean, one star. Yeah. Well, One here's star. the thing. Uh, you know, in the version that I watch, when you find out that new is Tyler Durden, <laughs> I mean, it just, wow. Uh, I, have to, I do have what, to Was that in the version that... that you guys saw? Did you, did you see that or did they no, cut that, that out? No, that wasn't there. It was, it was gone. Oh, they cut, they cut that yeah. out. Yeah, One was, star. Damn yeah, it. They, I missed the scene where she tried to sell soap to uh, <laughs> the Hicks, but I am Jack's face hugger. <laughs> This whole thing's already gone off the rails. Off the rail. Although I do have to say, <laughs> you bring up the earlier point makes me wonder if the Starship Enterprise crew, any of them, had ever run into xenomorphs. Like you know, there's a comic up. book somewhere. There's gotta yeah. be. There's but gotta it's like, be. I don't there's... feel like the, the Star Wars universe does not play well with Star this Trek. universe. Yeah, or Star Trek universe. I can't believe I did that. I'm the, so there sorry. are. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many star trek crossover comics and aliens crossover comics that if somebody hasn't done that they need to get to work on it uh so i, I do have to say before we really get going that uh you know our last episode our terminator episode thank you for everyone who listened to the whole thing it's very long uh, it's the longest episode we've ever done might be the longest episode we ever do because we might start putting like the bio stuff that took up the first like hour or so of that episode into its own episode. Let us know what you think about that though. Uh, if you like that, or if you like it all as one story, you know, like we kind of joked last time, nobody really listens to these podcasts in one go, unless you have a job where you can just sit and listen to it all the time. But I also think that, you know, in the spirit of James Cameron, we made an episode that's probably longer than it needed to be. Yeah. I was going to add, I almost feel bad, except it just means we're doing our fucking job. Yeah, like, we're researching. We're reason finding out. Yeah. Hey, we're, we're here. We, we still edited. It. We still edited a lot of stuff out of that from yeah. my notes and from the actual editing process. Or that could have been a four-hour episode easily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's a lot. There's there's no shortage of information about the creation of really any of these movies that we're going to talk about. It's exciting. I will say this: I did find in the interviews book apparently already in Terminator there was a sequence that they actually shot. It was going to be Sarah Connor getting wheeled out on a gurney. Yeah, at the end. Yeah, mm. when she's wheeled out, you realize that it's a factory and it's uh, it's Cyberdyne, and it was going to show that them uh. peeling off the hand and a person picking up the chip. Like, oh, like just setting up part two. Setting up part two. Like he already had that way back in the first. Wow. One. I just thought that was interesting. But interesting. Uh, they said they shot it, but for some reason the quality, the technical quality, wasn't good enough. He said, and they decided not to use that. I wonder if that if that deleted scene is like available anywhere. I'd like to look that up if it is. I'm curious. Yeah, that's interesting. So following the success of the Terminator, James Cameron was kind of thrust into the spotlight. You know, uh, that movie was made. We mentioned it was made for six million dollars. It made a ton of money, so he was automatically like kind of a star almost. Uh, So after that film, he had his choice of projects in Hollywood. But as we discussed in our Terminator episode, there was a time period during the development of that film that Cameron got a job as a screenwriter working on the sequel to Ridley Scott's Alien. And then against the advice of pretty much everyone in Hollywood who he spoke to about it, when Cameron was ready to move on to his first post-Terminator project, it was that Alien sequel that he returned to. Uh, The resulting film is going to be, of course, the subject of this week's episode, a film that marks Cameron's first to be produced within the studio system that he would make his home for the next several decades. And the movie we're talking about is 1986's Aliens. Just tell me one thing, Burke. You're going out there to destroy them, right? Not to study, not to bring back, but to wipe them out. That's the plan. All right, people, on the ready line. Movement. Talk to me, Hudson. Uh, 
I got signals. I got readings in front and behind. There's nothing back here. Look, I'm telling you, there's something moving and it ain't us. Get them out of there! They cut the power. How could they cut the power, man? They're animals. There's movement all over the place. Five meters, man. Four. Aliens. This time, it's war. The alien story doesn't start with James Cameron. Uh, this is a movie that was in development for or in the works for a while before he sauntered into the into the producer's office. Uh, at the time that it came out, you got to remember that it had been seven years since Ridley Scott's original film. That's a pretty long time between a first and second movie. Uh, so Brandywine Productions, which is the production company that had produced Scott's film, after that movie made so much money, they were pretty eager to get to work on a sequel. Now, if you recognize the name Brandywine Productions, uh, that means that you're probably a longtime listener of this show because uh, we have talked about them before. But just as a refresher, uh, Brandywine Productions was a film production company that had been founded by filmmakers Walter Hill, David Geiler, and Gordon Carroll in the late 1960s. Uh, Alien was really their birth their first big success. And honestly, if you look at their filmography, they haven't produced a ton of films and 90% of the films that they've produced are films from the alien franchise or related like alien versus predator. Like they're all, they all have the word alien in the title or the word <laughs> Prometheus in the title. Uh, so that's pretty much been their bread and butter. So why did it take seven years for a sequel to be made? Well, there, there were a variety of factors at play. Uh, first, you've got 20th Century Fox President Alan Ladd Jr. Uh, he was very supportive of doing an Alien sequel, but he left the studio. He went to actually to found his own studio uh, before the project ever really went forward. And his replacement was a guy named Norman Levy, and Levy was far less supportive of doing an Alien sequel. According to David Geiler, Levy thought the sequel would be a disaster. That's a, that's a direct quote from David Geiler, uh, which is an account that Levy disputes. <laughs> he says that he was really only concerned about the production costs. Uh, he said he, he, he kind of hems and haws that he wasn't necessarily opposed to it. He's just worried that it's going to cost a little too much. Uh, the studio, though, Fox, they were also worried that the success of Ridley Scott's film had kind of been a fluke and that audiences may not return for a sequel, that they were going to spend all this money and nobody would show up. Uh, because you've also got to keep in mind, at this time, the horror bubble was starting to burst, uh, thanks in a large part to the glut of less than stellar slasher films that had been released over the last couple of years. So grosses for the genre were starting to decline. So they were looking at it kind of from a financial standpoint. And you kind of, I mean, I kind of see their point, honestly, because horror was dying at this mm -hmm. by, by the mid 80s. I mean, the 80s are seen as like the horror, the golden age, sort of, but a lot of those like slasher movies came out in the uh, it, within a very short period of time. Uh, I mean, may, maybe one day we'll do a whole exploration of the slasher subgenre, but there were like hundreds of these slasher movies released within just a couple of years. So yeah, we have a lot to look back on, but the market got oversaturated. Basically. Well, it got oversaturated. What bugs me about that is the idea that horror was dying. Like it's like, you no know, slashers. Horror. It was slashers, but it was seen by the studio as a genre as a whole yeah it just bothers me that they did that it's like no it's just okay everybody who saw halloween and then friday the 13th was like oh you just have to have a guy walking around normal clothes and a knife or something then yeah, yeah that's that's easy easy money yeah and then you blew it up but things like alien worked that no but i mean that was sort of before, before the slasher craze began the slasher craze i think really began in full in 1980 with friday the 13th I'm just saying a xenomorph wasn't walking around in overalls and a pitchfork. It's I would not, watch that. I would, yeah. I would too, to be fair. Col college humor has to have done something like that, right? College humor. Do they still exist? <laughs> are they, are them and funny or die hanging out in the side room somewhere? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, that's awesome. I forgot all about that. The development on aliens was further delayed when Guyler Hill and Carol sued Fox for unpaid profits from aliens. By utilizing some what we'll call creative accounting methods, uh, Fox had declared that Alien was a financial loss, that there were no profits, despite the fact that the film made over $100 million on a $10 million budget. Uh, Hollywood, uh, look, you can actually look up like Hollywood accounting online. Like the, I, I literally think there's a Wikipedia page that says Hollywood accounting that's all about this phenomenon of studios kind of cooking the books essentially in a oh, way wow. that makes it seem like movies don't make any that ha haven't made any money so that they can 
you know, do things like this and not pay people the way that they're supposed to be paid. I mean, Corman was a prime example in our Little Shop of Horrors uh, episode. I mean, he was he was literally planning a whole film around the fact that he had to get it done before he needed to pay actors more. Right. (laughs) So this lawsuit, the alien lawsuit, ended up being settled by early 1983. But by that time, they'd already shaved years off the development time for a potential sequel. I mean, this is already four years from the original film's release. And by the end of it, Fox had agreed to finance the development of Alien 2, but they wouldn't be required to distribute it if they didn't want to. So by this time in in the timeline, there's already another new studio head at Fox. Uh, there, there, there's a rotating door in the top offices at Fox for a few years here. <laughs> this guy's name is Joe Wisen. Joe Wisen was receptive to the idea of an alien sequel, but he couldn't quite convince everyone at the studio. Like, I mean, obviously what he says goes, but not everyone was gung ho about going forward to this. They had, they had some reservations. So with the lawsuit out of the way and with a studio head that was at least open to the idea of alien Two, work on the sequel could officially begin. So Geiler asked his development executive, Larry Wilson, to start looking for someone to write a script for their Alien sequel. And it was during the search process that he came across a little sci-fi film that was in the early stages of development. That script was, of course, The Terminator. So as we discussed on our last episode, on that Terminator episode, there was a, a, about a nine-month period during the pre-production phase of The Terminator when James Cameron lost his film star uh, because Arnold Schwarzenegger became contractually required to shoot the sequel to Conan the Barbarian. Remember, um, Dino De Laurentiis essentially whisked him away to to work on his project. But during that nine months, he started shopping the Terminator script around as kind of an example of his writing talent, which is how it ended up on Larry Wilson's desk. Uh, He came in and swept me off my feet, and (laughs) which is impressive. I'm, I'm very large. (laughs) <laughs> that still doesn't sound like Arnold. No, that was it terrible. Sounds, it sounds like the... Ter- uh, Listen, fellas, it sounds I'll take like care the, of this. Todd, you suck. <laughs> what was the character on Animaniacs who had like the big muscle? <laughs> That's what it sounds more like. <laughs> uh, anyway. Night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, that's another Animaniacs joke. So good call. Back. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, Larry, Larry Wilson reads the script. He enjoys it. He thinks it's really good. So he passes it along to his bosses at Brandywine. And they agreed to meet with Cameron about writing this alien sequel. So when Cameron took the meeting, he didn't really know who Geiler and Hill were. Or rather, he, he knew who they were. Like, he knew, he knew Walter Hill's name. Walter Hill's a pretty famous director by this time. But he didn't know that they had produced the first alien film. What he did know is that he loved the original alien film. Uh, this wasn't just like a writing for money gig, although it was partially that. Uh, But Alien was a film that he considered the greatest sci-fi horror film ever made, calling it, quote, a high watermark in the genre. Uh, He had seen the film during its original theatrical release, uh, and he rewatched it obsessively while he was working on Galaxy of Terror for Roger Corman, which, of course, is kind of Roger Corman's Alien ripoff anyway, so it makes sense. Yeah, he'd gone and seen it with his buddy... uh... Randall Frakes on opening yeah. night, he said, uh, you might remember that name from last episode. Uh, this is the buddy you worked on Xenogenesis with. Jonathan Frakes' his brother, I think. Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> he worked with him on the Corman stuff and the effects department even after, I think. Um, he talks about how they used to love watching stuff together and they'd make fun of stuff throughout the film. And he had vivid memories of Alien that they went and they were just like sucked in immediately. Like they couldn't make fun of anything. They were just like drawn into the movie. The reason he was seeing Geiler and Hill was he was trying to, they were trying to remake Spartacus and they had like a, they wanted to do it sci-fi style. And so they thought Cameron was the guy to do it based on Terminator. And so that's what the pitch meeting was for. And Cameron was pumped about that and came in with all these ideas on how to do it. And it turned out Geiler and Hill weren't feeling the huge sci-fi epic idea exactly. They they still wanted the sword and sandals thing just on another planet. That was that'd be the sci-fi part of this whole thing. So it wasn't really going to work. John out. Carter Carter of Mars, right, right. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but just as Cameron, like you said, was walking out, they, they were like, "Well, wait, well, wait a second. Uh, there is this one idea we've been working on." So, so needless to say, you know, as a big fan of the original Alien, he's pretty excited about the idea of working on a sequel to that film. Uh, but he did kind of try to play it cool with these guys. He didn't want to seem like he was giddy about the idea of working on an Alien sequel. Uh, so he heard Geiler and Hill's pitch, which basically amounted to, 
Ripley and some soldiers. Let's do that. Let's throw some Marines in there. Uh, and he offered to write them a treatment on this. Uh, and so a credit he, to Guyler and Hill, according to Cameron, they'd really gone hard on their plans thus far. Like it was literally a, a half page that said, essentially, there's a colony. Everybody gets killed. So they send to the Marines. Yeah. And he said specifically, the notes ended with, and then some bullshit happens. <laughs> <laughs> so he had some gaps to fill in. He had to fill in the bullshit. <laughs> Ah, uh, uh, screenwriting 101. <laughs> that's a pro- that's producing 101. So. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Cameron returned with a 42 page treatment in November of 1983, one that he had written in just three days. Uh, this is and this is like a week after their meeting. So he returns a week later, uh, and that that treatment was based on a a script that Cameron had actually previously written about a year and a half earlier called Mother. The story for Mother, which had originally actually been called E.T. until Cameron found out that this guy, Steven Spielberg, was working on something under that name. <laughs> uh, it took place on Venus and its creature, its like main you know, monster was this human alien hybrid that had been genetically engineered to live in an, in an environment that was fatal to humans. Now, that's a detail that obviously as, as we've watched Aliens. We know that gets left out of the sequel, but Cameron does revive that a few decades later in Avatar. But a lot of mother, a lot of this script ended up in his Alien 2 treatment. The story ended with a battle between the titular mother alien and the film's lead, who at that time was a male, uh, who was wearing an exoskeletal loader called a power suit. Uh, So he has a lot of this already ready to go. And he just ends up modifying a little bit, adding a bunch of Marines, changing the lead character to Sigourney Weaver's uh, character Ripley. And voila, you've got Alien 2. When Cameron returned to Guyler and Hill just a a week after their initial meeting with basically the entire movie planned out, they were pretty impressed. They liked his idea. They liked his treatment. They hired him on the spot to write the full script. So it was at this time that Cameron was also hired to write Rambo 2. So he's working on three scripts at once. We've mentioned this in our Terminator episode. Uh, But before he can finish the Alien script, he's got to return to shoot the Terminator. Basically, he gets word. He's working on Aliens. He gets about two-thirds of the way through it, about 90 pages. And all of a sudden, Arnold's ready to go. He's back from Con- shooting Conan, and they can get back to the Terminator. So he had to kind of pause writing the script. Luckily, the executives at 20th Century Fox were impressed enough with the first 90 pages of the script that they actually offered to wait until Cameron was done with the Terminator so that he could finish writing it, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah let's let's focus on this for a second, because this is kind of cool of them. Uh, Cameron was happy he had aliens but guyler was the one who told him like when he came in it was like uh this is you know i got rambo too also i i don't don't know what to do now and guyler told him don't be stupid take both jobs and (laughs) uh so he did and and it was because i guess they felt like according to cameron he he said that maybe with the terminator script they felt like they had hit the jackpot or whatever reason but with the timing of that though like you said he had three months on all of these uh, this was like late 1984. Terminator was supposed to shoot next February. Rambo 2 was pretty immediate. So three sc- scripts, three months. And I don't want to miss this because this is the kind of dude we're working with here. And I, and I also, I fucking suck at time management. So this part just blew my no. mind. No. <laughs> <laughs> James Cameron <laughs> operates on a different level than everybody else, especially me. His brain and the Terminators are fairly similar and uh, <laughs> and I mean the actual Terminator, not Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't think Cameron comes when he does a bench press or whatever. Probably no, he, he comes, when he, he he comes when he shoots a gun. <laughs> 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 but what he did manage in this workflow is he he analyzed everything and decided each script would be two hours long. So 120 pages on the total page count of 360. He then divided the total number of waking hours that he had during the three month period, minus the time in the early hours that would be used for pre-production meetings on Terminator, divided that by the 360 and determined the number of pages per hour that he had to write. And he did that longhand on yellow legal pads. Uh, Each nerd alert. Yeah. (laughs) Each segment of his writing was marked with its own soundtrack, too. Like uh, Gustav Holst's The Planets for Alien 2 
he recommends Mars Bringer of War as a track from that one that people should enjoy. All uh, right. <laughs> Apocalypse Now soundtrack for Rambo First Blood Part 2. Makes and, sense. Vietnam, yeah. Uh, he didn't say specifically, but I'm presuming the clanging of metal things together for the Terminator. It was um, Stomp, the, uh, the, the, bro- the hit Broadway show. <laughs> <laughs> and he got lucky here, too. Being as prepared as he, they say, like luck is uh, preparation meets opportunity or whatever. He got lucky here too because what happened was, despite all of that shit, uh, he still didn't get everything done. Because, I mean, like you were talking about, Rambo Two was quite the job. Uh, you know, just for people who were wondering, Cameron was going all in on it with his normal passion, but where he wanted this like thoughtful, meticulous story, like the first film, pieces. yeah. He was dealing with the more established action badass in Sylvester Stallone, who definitely had pool and kept changing stuff up. I don't characters. know if you know this about Stallone, but he's got a bit of an ego. Yeah. <laughs> he was requesting revision after revision. By the time camera was done, he said, quote, it was it was as though we had them parachuting into Nam for a six pack of beer. <laughs> so, uh, don't get me wrong. To Rambo, be fair, Rambo 2 is awesome. I was going to say, don't <laughs> get me wrong, Rambo is another story, and I love the Rambo movies, and just to throw it out there, it ain't really Cameron's sophisticated action film vision, if anybody was wondering about that, no. but it's still a fun movie. It's a, uh, still let, a movie. And, let's, and let's clarify further, have any of you tried Vietnamese beer? <laughs> no, um, I did, mm. I it might be worth it. parachuting in for, fellas. That's true. That's I'd, you That's know, true. just consider. That's true. Uh, but my point about him being lucky was just because by the time all this happened, his schedule was fucked. He was like four drafts into Rambo 2. He'd only mm-hmm. got two acts into the Alien movie. It's time to start filming Terminator. And luckily, Fox decided to wait. They, they said yeah. it was like uh, Guyler and Hill had to go to Lawrence Gordon, who was the president of 20th Century Fox. Who uh, Yet another one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who this, is number, this is number four in our story so far. uh but yeah he 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 basically he thought that cameron had the talent to do it and uh, he loved what he'd written so far saying that quote in this business there are those decisions you agonize and lose sleep over but this was this one was so obvious it's a no-brainer uh everything about this guy spelled right guy and well and, and we know this about cameron and we'll we'll continue to learn it but he's a hell of a salesman Uh, Like he sells himself and he sells his projects with a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, And I think, and that, that seems to be catching when he's in the room with other guys, with other, with other uh, studio executives, producers, et cetera. He's able to convince people because he is genuinely enthusiastic about it, you know? Right. And, And, you know, the guys at Fox, they were so impressed with his script that they actually told him that if the Terminator turned out well, if this movie turns out good and makes some money and, and is, is a good movie, a well-made movie, then, you know, that kind of shows that Cameron's as good of a director as he is a writer. Then they'll also let him direct the sequel to Alien. Well, as we know, the Terminator turned out pretty well. Uh, we talked about it for three and a half hours uh, last week. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Terminator turned out pretty well. significant part of movie history. <laughs> Yeah, so the guy and the, then the guys uh, and the guys at Brandywine, the guys at Fox, they were ready to keep up their end of that agreement. But then all of a sudden, after Terminator came out, Cameron had become a hot ticket in Hollywood, and he didn't need the Alien 2 gig. Uh, he didn't need this job as like his next project. He had his choice of projects. But he's a dedicated guy, like we talk about. Michael yeah. Bean talked, uh, told a story about walking into Cameron's office literally the same morning of finishing like rapping Terminator and Cameron was in his office, like shoving cheese crackers in his mouth and like riding on the pad. And he's like, I got a treatment for aliens. I got to get there by 1230. He was like, this guy has a different kind of energy. Yeah. Uh, Julia Phillips, who was a producer, she was the producer behind uh, taxi driver and close encounters of the third kind. She warned Cameron that if he directed alien to, Anything good about the movie would be attributed to Ridley Scott's vision, and anything bad would be attributed to Cameron's. He was warned, uh, and not just by her, but by multiple people, he was warned that this could be career suicide. All that goodwill that he had gained from the Terminator could just go up in smoke uh, unless he just absolutely knocked this thing out of the park. But he persisted because, as he later said, it'll be cool. (laughs) <laughs> like he thought, you know, he he just he was a big like I said he was a big fan of Alien, so he just 
thought it would be cool to work on the next one. Yeah. I I mean, I'd take passion over, you know, talent. <laughs> yeah. Well, over most, <laughs> over a lot of things, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, I don't know about over talent. There's a lot of very untalented, very passionate people out there. <laughs> mm, <yeah. laughs> so while he was... you, Todd. <laughs> that's, that's fair. That's fair. So while I'm, he no, was... I'm known for being so dispassionate. <laughs> <laughs> so while he was working on his screenplay, he began calling the film Aliens with an S, you know, plural, Aliens. He pitched the title to Guyler and Hill. In a very James Cameron-like way, he held up a piece of paper. He had written the word alien on it uh, in big, you know, Sharpie, big black magic marker. Uh, then he added an S to it. And then he turned that S into a dollar sign. And uh, they loved it. And they agreed, agreed on the new title immediately. He sold them <laughs> just for that stupid thing. And, I told uh, you this fucking guy's a genius. Didn't I tell you that? <laughs> look, look, look at that. He turned the S into a dollar sign. This is a sequel and there's more than one. Get it? <laughs> it's fucking brilliant. I don't know why we turned Guyler and Hill into like <laughs> background characters from The Sopranos. It's just so many, so many. Uh, I don't I know. Expect- I think it goes I was, back I was to Texas Chainsaw expecting- being made by the mob. Yeah. <laughs> well, they took that idea, and that's how they made the Shit's Creek logo as well. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> oh yeah, from mm-hmm. Aliens. Yeah. It broke <laughs> Hill's heart that they didn't actually use a dollar sign. <laughs> <laughs> so there was still some trepidation at the studio at fox not at brandywine they were gung-ho but at fox there was still a little bit of trepidation about it uh because at this time in the early 80s i mean things were very different than they are now uh it was not a foregone conclusion that a sequel to a hit film would be profitable uh, there weren't a ton of sequels at the time there were some and obviously it had very recently worked for star wars but it still wasn't like a regular occurrence like it is now but they had faith that their concept of a war film set in space had the potential to be a big hit. And for Cameron, the idea of making a war film was creatively very exciting for him. Uh, it's probably, honestly, part of this is probably what uh, attracted him to Rambo 2 as well. Uh, he saw Aliens as something like The Dirty Dozen, like a film where you've got this uh, scruffy diverse group of soldiers you know an ensemble and they find themselves trapped behind enemy lines and enemy and and behind enemy lines where the enemies are more equipped to fight than they are and there were other advantages to making an aliens uh war film Uh, cameron first of all there's there's going to be comparison between this and ridley scott's movie right there's no way to get around that when you're making a sequel and he knew that he wouldn't be able to create this atmosphere of dread that was any better than what Scott had already done. He wasn't even going to try to do what Ridley Scott did. So he wanted to take it in a different direction, one that would allow him to graft his own style onto the film. He basically wanted to take the alien premise and turn it into a James Cameron movie, right? He didn't want to make a Ridley Scott movie. But Cameron was also a child of the 60s, right? He, he grew up during the Vietnam era. So even though he had been too young to go to war, it was a regular occurrence in his life as a kid where, you know, he saw coverage of the war on the news every day. It was everywhere. It was all, all over the place. Uh, and he had also immersed himself in the war while he was researching for Rambo too. He'd read a lot of books. He watched Apocalypse Now a lot, like, like Gary mentioned. Uh, and he ended up using kind of the attitude and lingo of U.S. troops in Vietnam, these like cocky soldiers uh, for his colonial Marines. He would later say, uh, quote, it was a definite parallel to Vietnam to tell the story of a technologically superior military force, which is defeated by a determined, furtive, asymmetric enemy. The pride before the fall. Uh, he'd say mm-hmm. like the, yeah. these guys are trained they're armed to the gills they're ready for anything and then they're gonna get fucked up by bugs basically yeah, yeah. is uh <laughs> you know and it, it just it just the, the, they're so so sure of themselves and what they're capable of that they're not prepared actually for what they're going to deal with that it, yeah. this enemy is going to bring it's not going to be until i feel like avatar that he gets really into like really showing like humanity more so like in the violence part of it maybe i'm wrong we'll, we'll find out i don't know i that's the first one that comes to mind but but it, he talks about dealing with cyborgs or uh he calls them huge hungry praying manises uh he says you don't in his words, flounder in morality 
either. You're not killing human beings. You don't have to ask yourself, you know, anything questions about this. So that makes it a little easier to like do the violence that's going to happen, you know, and that yeah. sort of thing. But you, you mentioned something else I wanted to bring up too, is like that for him, aliens was had to be completely different than alien uh, while st- still being an extension of the first film. But he, he, in some interviews refers to it as a prequel uh, of like that movie is a prequel. Like he's like, that's the prequel to my movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's like the writer, uh, Dan O'Bannon, the director Ridley Scott established a set of elements, which can't be violated, but they only created part of the universe, which primarily dealt with life and death within the confines of a spaceship. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he gets to, flesh out the world yeah and, uh so he says uh you know he he said they literally existed in a vacuum uh there was no past or life beyond that film um and ripley who's the only survivor because she's a very strong female he said that that impressed him very much and he wanted to take that character further to know ripley as a person and get into the depth and emotion that ripley had so the movie for him was about her because she's the one connecting tissue you can get inside her mind. Uh, she's going back to face her worst nightmare and to conquer it, that sort of thing. It's about her revenge. I'm sure we'll talk more about that stuff. But to him, it was basically like Ripley is the thing that connects the two things. Otherwise, it's like there is an established like aliens exist. We know that. But there's no other stuff that necessarily like, you know, really story wise connected. He just treats himself like he's doing this whole other thing. Well, yeah, I mean, because Ripley's the only thing left over from the original film. She's the, she's the lone survivor of the Nostromo. So she's yeah. the only connecting element. So, and, and while he was writing the screenplay, he was very well aware that he needed to use Ripley as like that connecting force. So his screenplay ended up featuring Ripley in pretty much every scene. I mean, when he was writing the screenplay, he kept a photo of Sigourney Weaver at his desk to kind of keep him on track. The problem with that, was that Weaver had no idea that a sequel was being worked on. She was not under contract to make a sequel, and she had really no interest in ever revisiting the world of Alien. So Cameron finds out this information, comes as kind of a shock to him, uh, because you'd think that maybe his producers or Fox or somebody might have mentioned this, uh, but... Cameron being James Cameron, uh, he took matters into his own hands. He called Weaver, who's in France, uh, working on a movie at the time. He called her and he said, look, you don't know me from Adam, but I just wrote this script I'm calling Aliens. And now I'm in an in an embarrassing situation. I've been working on this film for some time, but now I'm being told that you don't know anything about it. So he asked her if he can send her a script. And Weaver, she was a little hesitant, but she agreed to read the script. And when she did, uh, she was pleasantly surprised by Cameron's treatment of the Ripley character because he really does give her a lot more to chew on than the original film did. To hear him talk about it, it's like you're talking about the Vietnam style thing. I mean, these old style movies that he's thinking of basing this movie on, Sigourney Weaver is his John Wayne. And so now he finds out like, oh, oh, so the star of the whole fucking thing is not involved. That's right. Pretty (laughs) fucked. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, in the original movie, we don't learn a lot about Ripley as a character. Uh, there's not a lot of backstory. There's not a lot of life beyond the film. Uh, but Cameron gave her a backstory. He's the one that gave her the first name of Ellen. Uh, he reveals that she had a daughter back on Earth who aged and died while Ripley was in hypersleep. Uh, this is a scene that was cut out of the version of the film that was released theatrically, although it was, of course, restored in the in the director's cut. But the character's maternal instinct still becomes a big part of the story when she takes the little girl Newt under her wing. So he, he's definitely playing with this. Um, and in Scott's film, Ripley wasn't written as a woman. Uh, Dan O'Bannon and Ron Shu said they, they originally wrote it as a man, but it was not. there was nothing really specific about the gender. Uh, so casting Sigourney Weaver in that role really added a whole other element to the film. But here... Cameron's treatment of the character makes her even more complex because she is portrayed as both a mother and a warrior. Uh, and we, we, we've mentioned Rebecca Keegan's book, The Futurist, uh, the, the James Cameron biography that me and Gary have been reading. And in that, she, she has a great quote in that. She says, Cameron managed to treat her gender as both the heart of her character and a complete non-issue. Uh, and I absolutely love that because she's she nails it. I mean, that's exactly what he's doing. The it doesn't like her being a woman doesn't seem doesn't really seem to matter to any of the people around her. Uh, doesn't um, matter to the Marines. And so many of these movies, the Marines are you know would would be 
bother that there's this woman tagging along who's not even a Marine and, you know, uh, but it's not an issue here at all. But the fact that she is a woman adds a lot of gravitas to her story, especially as once she, once Newt comes into play. So Weaver, uh, I have a she, dog named Ripley, by the way. Is it named after this? It is. I named okay. her specifically after Sigourney Weaver's character in the Alien films. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What's your other dog's name? Uh, Willow. I mean, I already knew that, but I our, our she's named not. after Willow from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Not from the not from the movie with Warwick Davis. No, although I could go with that since there's a series coming. Yeah, looks pretty good. Yeah, I don't I don't even care about Willow. You you never liked the movie. I I actually am a big fan of the movie, but just because of Val Kilmer, I think is Mad Morgan is fantastic. Yeah. But that's a whole <laughs> other movie. It's not for now. <laughs> We're not talking about that. <laughs> So Sigourney Weaver agreed to meet with Cameron, but she had a few notes for him. Uh, she wanted Ripley to die in the film. She didn't want the character to use guns. Uh, and she wanted Ripley to make love to the alien. Uh, Cameron wisely vetoed all of these. Uh, although all of those things happen. Uh, I was about to say her power will grow after this one, though. So look out. Yeah, yeah. All <laughs> of those things happen uh, between the the subsequent this and the subsequent subsequent movies. Uh, but at the time, Cameron's like, "No, nah, this, no, we're not doing that." Uh, but their creative tug of war kind of forced him to think about the character differently and showed him how much that she really cared and had invested in this character. Yeah, I think he he learned to work with actors and such a lot more in this one. Uh, yeah. So that's that's nice. She said that he came to her and told her, if you think of the first one as a fun house, this one is the roller coaster. Nice. So that's how I put it. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. <laughs> uh, and of course, at this point, uh, Weaver still has not signed on to make the movie. Uh, she does not have a contract. And the year since Alien, she had become a star. Uh, she had become fairly famous. She'd appeared in movies like The Year of Living Dangerously. Of course, Ghostbusters, uh, we all know. And since there was an entire script written around her, she thought that she had some pretty good negotiating power for a fat paycheck. Uh, but the studio did not quite see it that way. And they were kind of holding out on her. And then uh, in April of 1985, contract negotiations stalled only a few months before the movie was set to start shooting. They still don't have their star signed on. And at this point, Cameron had already had to fight to get Gail Ann Hurd hired by the studio as a producer in the film because they didn't really see her as a real producer, either due to her youth, uh, she was only 29 years old at the time, or because of her romantic relationship to Cameron, uh, they thought you know it was a producer and credit only kind of thing, you know, so they didn't really want to hire her. But Cameron eventually convinced them. And no, it wasn't long after this, when Cameron and Heard got married. And then just before the couple left to go get married, they went to Maui for a destination wedding. And just before they got on the plane to go, Cameron told Fox that they had until he returned to finalize Weaver's deal or he was out and Heard was out. They were done. Like, you got to get Sigourney Weaver or we're not doing this movie. But then when they returned, Weaver still didn't have a contract, which put Cameron in kind of a sticky spot uh, because it's like, okay, do I stick to my word? and walk away or do I just kind of go with it and see what we can do? But he had a plan in mind. So here's, here's what he does. Uh, it's just, I love this story, by the way, the camera calls Arnold Schwarzenegger's agent at ICM, ICM being the, the talent agency, uh, which also happened to be the talent agency where Weaver was represented. So he told uh, Arnold's agent that he's like, ah, I'm gonna, I've decided I'm going to drop the Ripley character. Uh, we don't need it. Let's get rid of it. Uh, we're going to build the story around Newt and the Marines. And that way aliens would be 100% James Cameron's film. It's going to be my movie with no baggage left over from Scott's original. So people aren't going to be like comparing it. And that, that's, that's how the phone call goes. He hangs up the phone uh, declaring just before he hangs up that, all right, I'm going to go start on the script. Now let's go. Hangs up the phone. Of course, Cameron had no intention of writing Ripley out of the script. Uh, but after he hung up the phone, Schwarzenegger's agent called Weaver's agent because remember, they're co-workers. Weaver's agent calls Fox. By the end of the day, Weaver had been hired. Her contract had been signed, and she ended up getting paid a million dollars, which was about 30 times more than she had been paid for the original film. Oh, wow. <laughs> he <laughs> argues, he, he says that he thinks that she might have gotten the biggest payday for a female leading actress uh, ever. Well, I looked this up, by the way, though, and, and probably that goes to Elizabeth Taylor. Um, 
when she played Cleopatra. Cleopatra. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she got like a million bucks and then also uh, got like 10% of profit or something. That was, well, that movie didn't make any money. Uh, but <laughs> a, that movie was a, 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 one of the most famous bombs in movie history. But a million dollars in 1960s money is what she made. Yeah, yeah. And uh, ah. versus 1980s money. Oh, I, yeah. I think they said like literally uh, the, the article I was reading said that probably ended up like technically she would be making like seven million dollars yeah. or something by the time the deal was done in modern terms. So, yeah. but anyway, but 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 James Cameron says she was not Elizabeth Taylor, but Sigourney Weaver, worth every penny, and they should yeah. have just ponied that up in the first place. They should have. Many of the film's other roles were filled by faces that were already familiar for Cameron. Uh, he cast Michael Bean as Hicks, the Marine squad leader, uh, Bill Paxton, who, you know, his old buddy who had helped uh, build sets on the Roger back in the Roger Corman days, who had had a small role at the beginning of the Terminator. He plays a Marine named Hudson. Who's kind of the movie's uh, comic relief, I guess you'd say. And of course, Cameron's old buddy, Lance Hendrickson's there who he'd met in his, the like four or five days that he was directing Piranha 2. Hendrickson actually had to audition though. Like he, he, yeah. Yeah, because he said that uh there was like a edict that they like had to have like they could only have so many American people. Yeah, because they're working in England. So they're they have to have a certain percentage uh, of English uh yeah so like Hendrickson actually had to audition against uh several other people. They were trying to really pitch the Android part, I guess because of the prior movie maybe, but they said that they were really trying to pitch that as a British uh, actor yeah. yeah i get that i mean uh you know ian holmes british and uh does does uh fassbender talk in his accent in in you the know, Prometheus I was, movies i can't no, remember it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty midwest is it okay yeah. uh, so well it, it, hendrickson gets the role he plays an android named bishop uh and it's i was watching this last night and i was going man why would they design an android to look like lance hendrickson <laughs> <laughs> Like, why would you're manufacturing an android why would you make it look like i i get why you make it look like michael fassbender right lance hendrickson's got an enormous forehead <laughs> it's true t- terrifying <laughs> eyes these like these these like uh, canyons in his face and male pattern baldness <laughs> like but then again why would you why would you design an android to look like ian holm like oh let's make an android he's gonna look like a person but a foot and a half shorter than a normal guy. Like, he's gonna be that. like a foot. He's gonna be like a short Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, he's gonna, gonna be. Just a, yeah. just, oh my god! Yeah, short gray hair, a <laughs> little bit of a tummy. <laughs> yep, <laughs> that's it. Well, you know what's even more fucked up though, too, is well, maybe not more fucked up, but uh, I did not realize this until we were, I was researching this time. They had James uh, Remar cast for Hicks. Yeah, originally uh, he was uh, Michael Bean was not cast in the role. It was James Remar, uh, who I guess most people he's in everything, but Dexter's dad is probably his most famous. Yeah, role. that's not that's always yeah. my go-to. Yeah, but he's in so many fucking things, and always a guy that I think like, oh, that guy looks like Lance Hendrickson. So I <laughs> I love the idea that they could have been in a movie together, like yeah. side by side, and you'd have been like, this is weird. They both have like Smoker's voice and that. Uh, <laughs> male pattern baldness, slick back <laughs> hair. And, well, James although, Remar, he he worked on the film for a couple yeah, of weeks. He was the body double for Hicks. What? what he, uh, no, he wasn't. I saw he was the body double. Well, no, he was. He well, was hired I think to what be you're Hicks. thinking of is they. they he well, says I'm not reading the books, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say. I, I think what you might be thinking of is like. I mean, he definitely says there's scenes where it is him. Yeah, in, he he in he worked scene. on the film for a, a couple of weeks before he got fired he got fired because uh, he was caught with illegal drugs in his possession which seems like a really weird reason for an actor to get fired uh, because <laughs> you know but i don't know maybe he uh, I, I don't know the story that's a story that he told on a podcast a couple years ago uh, yeah well he, because when they officially released it they said it was just like mutual uh differences or yeah whatever, yeah however but, they put but, it. but he, but he, he admitted, admitted it was drugs yeah. Yeah, um, it was drugs. Yeah. And, and so Bean was a last minute replacement. He was only hired a few days before like his scenes were to be shot. He complained he didn't get to everybody got custom armor when they were making it. But Bean didn't get that. He said that the heart with a locket on his chest looked like too much of a bullseye. He would have never chosen that. But uh, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I swear to God, that's what he said. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he also, you know, I, I told I talked about him last episode. It's just like he seems like such a nice guy, but he still stands by that 
Cameron is the only person he says that ever really cast him as such heroic characters. Yeah. Uh, he said, like, like Hicks and Reese. Uh, he said, everybody else he does seems- play a lot of bad guys. Yeah, he says everybody else must look at him and see something wicked in his eyes or think for some reason people meet him and think something wrong with him. Anyway, I guess Cameron comes around. We'll we'll talk about that in the next movie, I guess. But um, So Jeanette Goldstein, who was a bodybuilder, actually, with no previous acting experience at all before this, uh, and she would later appear in both Terminator 2 and Titanic. She plays Vasquez in uh, what I can only describe as brown face because... i was gonna say like i saw this <laughs> yeah. like, people are, are complaining about it. i'll, I'll okay. say this on in titanic she plays an irish immigrant mm. so <laughs> well there you, there you go and uh for newt the little girl cameron found a nine-year-old girl another one with no acting experience named carrie hen uh, he had a bunch of kids that uh, that auditioned for this and he didn't like any of them all these kids that had like previous acting experience he said they would always like smile after they'd say a line he's like that's fine for like a pepsi commercial but not when you're <laughs> not when you're like hiding for you, you just saw your entire family obliterated and you're you're running for your life hiding from killer aliens kid are you trying to sell me a soft drink or did your <laughs> fucking family get murdered right in front of your face <laughs> uh so and, and once again todd i know that at least one of these actors that i've mentioned without even researching it has appeared in a star trek movie i actually know a couple of them yeah uh, but i want to see what you've dug up well folks for this week's installment of whom i trekking with we've got three actually uh from the entire uh from the entire show aliens uh it's basically uh they're all marines uh up first we got uh daniel cash as private spunkmeyer he's done uh two episodes of star trek discovery was that, your nickname? <laughs> was that your nickname in high school spunkmeyer <laughs> listen i let i let the uh full brazilian comment go i didn't make a joke <laughs> about full brazilian at all because i mean i was like oh so many i can't get them all out uh, all right but we're, uh, we're still yeah. problematic no matter what we do <laughs> that's right not to be but, wait, then, wait, but, wait, we, wait. but we can keep letting todd and gary on the show <laughs> hold, hold on <clears throat> i'm also known as something of a spunk meyer how about that there we go oh i was go saying that clip. for dick bush oh we're getting there <laughs> uh anyways so uh yeah uh Who, daniel, wait, cash, wait, daniel cash okay yeah That's he's done he, he did a couple episodes of star trek discovery uh mark rolston as drake uh he started off on uh star trek the next generation season seven episode 18 eye of the beholder and uh, then he did a couple episodes of star trek enterprise uh season two episode 17 Can- uh, oh, so is that, that's one you've covered then. yeah 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 absolutely and then uh coming up in the final uh season of enterprise season four episode 16 the augments which was d- uh directed by lavar burton and then uh i don't know who act- that is yeah you don't know it's, no, he, I, never, I don't know who that is he, he reads kids books it's not a big deal <laughs> anyway um is he 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 can't is he not able to read adult books well there's a question about how well he can see <laughs> <laughs> and all that so yeah anyway but uh mark ralston also was in an episode of the fan made star trek continues uh season one episode nine what ships are for uh if anybody out there is at all curious about some of the fan made star trek stuff a lot of it is not great what no but star i know i know i know hard to believe a fan-made product isn't really up to snuff but actually star trek continues is really really fantastic and it's all on youtube okay. it kind of it kind of acts like season four of the original series it's very very good <laughs> um and then we've got Jeanette goldstein uh as private vasquez uh she was in star trek generations as yeah, a science officer i don't even think her character has a name no, no, she just credited <laughs> a science officer. Uh, she was also in uh, the video game Star Trek Invasion in 2000 as Typhon Engineer. And then uh, she's also been on two episodes of Star Trek Short Treks as the USS Enterprise computer. So uh, is that, what is Short Treks? Is that a Paramount Plus thing? It's it, yeah, basically uh, between uh, between some of the seasons of Discovery, they came out with this thing called Short Treks, and it's a bunch of short films. Like they're 15, not not animated, 15. like they're live action. Some of, yeah, they're some live of them are. Some well, of them some, are. Oh, yeah. it's, it's a mix. Okay, 
but she, yeah, but she, she does the computer's voice. She's the voice of the U.S. That's pretty cool. That's yeah, cool. it's actually pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I knew she was in Generations. That's the one. Yeah. And I knew, and I knew that Mark Rolston. Had had done some Star Trek stuff. Oh yeah, and yeah. that's everybody in Star Trek. So, I love. Did you watch the commentary where they got to like uh, they were they were coming out of their little uh, sleeping chambers and everybody when uh, Rico Ross who plays uh, Private Frost got out and he's like all ripped up. They were like, "Oh, there's Rico. Fuck that guy." <laughs> <They're> <laughs> like, so, so Bill Pax is like. Yeah, man, I gave up like a week into that. I I like beer too much. <laughs> uh, I gotta say, man. like I, you know, having I mean, this might be getting a little bit of a ahead because we kind of save this stuff for the end. But like, I really dug uh, Hudson this time. I, I Hudson's always been kind of annoying to me, but something about it. This he's time supposed was, to be a little annoying, but he's he just says it in the commentary. He yeah. talks about like he's like, hey, yo. Uh, People are supposed to be ready for me to die when it's time to die. But <laughs> well, I, I think he kind of redeems himself towards you know the end, though. Like he becomes mm-hmm. someone you care about. But yeah, I mean, Bill Paxton's one of those characters. I think about this. I love Bill Paxton. I think he's just I, I, there's something really charming about him. But there, for some reason, I've never thought he was like a great actor. Like I feel like there's something about Bill Paxton's performance and everything that he does where I can feel him acting. Mm. Uh, you know what I mean? Does that make yeah. sense? And I don't know yeah. what it is, but I, I still love him regardless. And I like watching him on screen because he's got a screen presence. But his performances are always a little like actory. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it other than it doesn't feel real. It feels like a guy playing a role. Even even yeah. during the speech in Independence Day. That's the that's, that's his, Bill Pullman. That's the other guy. I'm just kidding. I just. <laughs> This is but, where you it, this is where you insert the sound clip of the two of them from SNL. I'm Bill Paxton. I'm Bill Payne and I'm <laughs> Bill Paxton. So the the cast here though, you know, I think it's one of the biggest strengths of this film. I mean there's a lot of love given to Sigourney Weaver, very well deserved, uh, but I think that this ensemble is really what makes uh, it or rather is a big part of what makes this movie so good uh because this is a war movie right and mm-hmm. the best war movies are only as good as their assembled characters a, a great war movie is only as good as the soldiers that are in it uh mm-hmm. and, and think of something like you know james cameron wanted to make something like, like the dirty dozen the dirty dozens that way every character is great or for a more recent example inglorious bastards like every ah. character yeah brad pitt's the star of he's the lieutenant in charge but Every character under him gets great little moments, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, great war, great war movies, I think, are more about the soldiers than they are about the fight. And I think that Aliens really gets these soldiers right, Uh, at least the main ones, the ones that don't die immediately. (laughs) (laughs) Each character kind of gets their own little moment. Uh, even the ones in like smaller roles, they get their own little moments. Uh, my favorite of which is uh, honestly one of my favorite lines in the whole movie, which is uh, when Hudson asks Vasquez, have you ever been mistaken for a man? To which she replies, no, have you? And I laugh at that line <laughs> every time I watch this. That's a, it, you, you, just, you immediately get this great little antagonism between them. Then mm-hmm. her and uh, Mark Rolston's character, they've got this great like buddy uh you know, thing going on. They're they're like bros. They're both the ones with the big giant gun that they carry around their oh, waist. Yeah. Which, by the way, that was just a um, steady cam. Steady cam. It was a steady cam rig. <laughs> I was thinking that looked like a steady cam. Rig. <laughs> it was a steady cam rig. But at the time, Cameron was like, uh, you know, and this was probably true in 1986 that nobody, people, the general public didn't know what a steady cam rig looked like. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So they're like nobody will know that that's what it is, but of course now people do. I think uh, but- I think Vasquez I think Vasquez is the reason why I like to get hit during sex. Yeah, I get it. Mm. Um she probably doesn't like men honestly. I'm just I mean that's just <laughs> <laughs> just i'm just guessing uh but she, she's i think Jeanette goldstein is great in this i think mark rolston is great in it even though he doesn't last that long but like in the small amount of time he's on screen i think he's really good uh he was very inexperienced at the time he had done a little bit of tv before this but this was his first movie uh but he's gone on of course to become like a great character actor he often plays cops or soldiers uh he's in you know saw he's in he's in all kinds of stuff mm-hmm. but or one of the saw movies i can't remember which one But uh, one of the great indicators, I think, of just how great the chemistry was between the actors who who played the Marines 
is that other people kept casting them in movies together. Yep. <laughs> like after this, I mean, Cameron, of course, uses several of them in later films. But then not long after this, Catherine Bigelow, uh, director Catherine Bigelow, she cast Paxton Hendrickson and Goldstein in Near Dark, which is her amazing vampire movie that she directed. Right. Uh, Goldstein and Rolston appeared together in Lethal Weapon 2. And of course, Paxton, pa- Paxton and Bean, of course, uh, appeared together in Tombstone. Nice. So like people yeah, kept yeah. seeing like them work. It's, it's almost like people saw them working together and like these guys work great together. There's a lot of chemistry on screen and just kept grabbing a couple of them for roles here and there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Goldstein's in Terminator 2. We're going to talk about that eventually. She, yeah, uh, she's John's, John's John's foster mother. And uh, so is Bill Paxton. No, he's not. But you know what would be funny is if Bill Paxton was in every Terminator movie as a person who gets killed immediately in the first five minutes. <laughs> he's, the, he's the red shirt of Terminator yes. movies. I'm yes! <laughs> uh, so once his cast was assembled, all of the actors playing Marines had to participate in a two-week boot camp. Uh, not for training purposes necessarily, although that was part of it, but really it was to get them to bond so that they would appear authentic as a team on screen. Now, uh, the, the exceptions were uh, Sigourney Weaver didn't come because they wanted her to kind of seem like an outsider. Uh, same with Bishop. Uh, Lance Hendrickson wasn't there for the very same reason. And Michael Bean wasn't there because he wasn't had not been hired yet. <laughs> so he didn't get to really uh, bond with the rest of them. But but even in the commentary, like when you watch the uh, when you watch that, they 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 seem like they legitimately do all love each other like they they seem yeah. like they really like each other even when they're sitting down together just like oh it's good to see you like every 20 years we'll get to hang out <laughs> and, <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> it's uh but they they see they seem like buddies and uh and and it's nice to hear stories about sigourney by the way too because like she seems great but like i even uh, bill pullman tell the stories about her is like she's so nice like i thought i was fucking up so bad or something <laughs> because she was just like really sweet to me like, like, almost like Sigourney Weaver thought he was like, he was simple. They thought he was simple. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. He's that's like, funny. but no, she's just that nice. So while he had planned on including, you know, the chest burster, the face huggers, and other design elements from the first film, James Cameron also wanted to put his own stamp on the film's monsters. And the script's Alien Queen really gave him the chance to show out. Uh, so Cameron, he, he came up with this idea. He painted the concept himself, uh, creating a sort of cross between a Black Widow spider and a dinosaur. Uh, this creature that he created, that, that he was envisioning, was huge. It was going to be 14 feet tall, dragging this distended egg sack full of little baby aliens or eggs. Uh, so the question, though, was how is he going to pull this off practically on set? Remember, this is pre-CGI. For this job, he recruited his old pal, Stan Winston. So he explained this concept to Winston and kind of how they thought they could pull it off. Uh, He said, uh, we'll get a couple of guys. We'll put them in a suit. Uh, We'll have the puppeteers work in the legs. Uh, But Winston, he couldn't really see it. He didn't see how this could possibly work. But he was like so many other people are. He was sold by James Cameron's enthusiasm. So Cameron actually went so far as to sketch out a drawing of how the two puppeteers would operate the queen. Uh, The puppeteers would operate the queen's forearms while lying back to back in a body tray inside the torso of the queen. And Cameron actually proposed that they build a crude mock-up of the puppet out of foam and black garbage bags just to see if his concept would work. So they built this thing uh, at at Stan Winston's studio, his garage uh, at, at, or his warehouse at his studio. They built this thing that was sort of shaped like the alien queen, but very a very crude rendition. Uh, and it worked to everyone's surprise, except of course, James Cameron's, who was pretty confident that it was going to work. Yeah. Uh, and, and Winston, by the way, Winston had to, he had to expand his crew. He had to hire a bunch more people. I think he expanded to a crew of about, of about 40 during this time, uh, mostly to work on Aliens, although because he had the expanded crew, he was able to also work on another film simultaneously, which was Toby Hooper's Invaders from Mars. Oh. Which just celebrated its, its anniversary a couple of days ago. Nice. I haven't seen it, but I, I want to. Yeah, you didn't watch it when we did a whole episode. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I'm joking. 
guys. <laughs> so uh, Winston's team set out to build the real thing after seeing that it could work. Although the final product was a bit more complex than Cameron's proposal. And in the end, it took 14 to 16 operators to move the queen on set. Uh, the head, neck, and body were hydraulic, hydraulically controlled. Uh, the legs were puppeted externally using rods. And the face, lips, jaw, and tongue were operated by cables. So it's a very complex, very large puppet. Uh, this is not a miniature. The size of the alien queen that we see on the screen is how big that thing was oh wow yeah <laughs> there's, there's no miniature work it's here. pretty insane and then you know like the good part for cameron coming into this movie is like most of the stuff had been designed prior to this but the queen was one of those things that like he came up with and yeah. it feels like most of his story is uh people telling him or you know him them saying like come up with something for this and then he does and they're like that can't be done and then he does it and yeah. you know he's <laughs> bossing people around until they do it H.R. Geiger, who had been the uh, the creature designer for Scott's film, of course, uh, we all know H.R. Geiger, uh, he wasn't involved in the design process for Aliens at all, which was a decision that Cameron would later uh, regret. Uh, and the reason, by the way, that Cameron didn't want H.R. Geiger on the set is because he was kind of afraid that another uh, artist with as big of a vision as someone like like H.R. Geiger, Geiger, Geiger? I think, I think we called him through. Geiger last time. H.R. Yeah. Geiger, uh, he, he, he was just afraid that Cameron was basically afraid that he wouldn't be able to get his own vision across if he, if he was working with someone as visionary as H.R. Geeker. Mm. Uh, that, that's kind of what it, it, it mounted to. Although, like I said, he, in later years, he would regret that and wish that he had gotten him in, involved in the film. But he did get a couple of other artists involved, a couple of other artists that he admired. And they were uh, two guys named Sid Mead and Ron Cobb. Uh, Mead was known as a visual futurist in Hollywood. He had made a career out of creating vehicles in sci-fi movies like Blade Runner for Ridley Scott nice. uh, in Tron. Uh, he would, in this film, he'd be responsible for the massive uh, Sulaco spaceship, the spaceship that transports Ripley and the Marines uh, to LV-426. Ron Cobb is a guy that we've actually discussed before on the show back in our Dan O'Bannon series. Uh, this Cameron series is related. It seems to be linked to that Dan O'Bannon series in so many ways, other than just the fact that he's making a sequel to a Dan O'Bannon movie. But uh, Cobb had actually designed, uh, we actually talked about him before Alien because he had designed the, the titular spaceship in Dark Star, which is John Carpenter's directorial debut, which was written by and co-starred Dan O'Bannon. Mm. And, John, and, and James Cameron's, uh, you know, Jim's worked with John Carpenter on Escape from new york and That's true, yeah. uh yeah he he referenced uh last week i mentioned a reference he made to cronenberg it's weird it's almost as though you plotted all these out in this way that we can make all these weird connections or just hollywood <laughs> is so incestual it's very incestuous yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh he i, I do I, I definitely plan some series after others for a reason but i i am constantly surprised by the connections that we end up finding as we do this. It's a wrong cop. He had also done some preliminary work on the original alien back when O'Bannon was still developing it. I think even before Ridley Scott got involved with it. Uh, but more often than not, James Cameron simply used his own designs. I mean, most directors can't sketch, paint and build things themselves the way that Cameron does. Uh, and he, he knows more than anyone else what he wants his designs to look like in the end. So there's none of this like going back and forth with an artist trying to get what the artist is doing to look like what the thing looks like in, in your head, right? So, because Cameron has the talent as an artist to just do it himself. So oftentimes that's what he does. You know, Michael Bean, they said like, what, what do you think makes Cameron so good at what he does and like how he's able to handle these things? And Michael Bean even pointed out, he was like, yo, it's, it's that he seems to know everybody's job as good as they do. Like he just he just knows all the spots yeah. and he knows exactly what's supposed to be happening. And so he can jump in at any point in any position and tell you how it's supposed to be done. And one of his designs was the, uh, the power loader that Ripley uses to fight the queen during the film's climax. Uh, and that power loader was inspired by Robert Heinlein's starship troopers uh, in the novel. We actually talked a little bit about this on our starship troopers episode uh, back, back last year, but in the novel, uh, the, not, it's not in Verhoeven's film, but in the original book, the infantry troops wear exoskeletal suits in combat. Yeah. Uh, so until like the, the, the sixth 
sci-fi uh b movie yeah. version that i think they finally start using them well I, they're I a little seen. bit different than they are also in, in this because in starship troopers they like jump around like they like they can yeah. jump really far distances so they didn't they didn't put them in the movie of starship troopers because they thought that would look goofy and it would honestly <laughs> But you know he was a fan of this design, like or this. Oh yeah, concept. of course. I mean, even if we talked about his sh- early short film Xenogenesis uh, on our Terminator episode, and if you watch that movie, you will see that the power loader is a design that he's had in the back of his mind, just waiting for an opportunity to use for quite a while, because he one hundred percent has a power loader in that little short film. It was uh, we talked about that on the last movie, but uh, it's it's fucking. Man, I, I watched this movie as a kid and uh, just, well, throughout my whole life, I've seen this movie and I've had always, it wasn't until this time that I've been like, well, James Cameron fucking made a power loader. Like, why are we not making like huge exoskeletons? Like, that just seems <laughs> like it's easy to do. He clearly did. That's not CG. It's, it's, it's uh, a suit, but it's, a well, suit. it's got a guy in it. It's got a fucking guy in it. There's he's a guy got like a it. stunt performer in <laughs> yeah. there. It's he's like got a big, big burly man in it. A big burly British 270 pound man <laughs> yep. inside that suit. And he sits there and he's got like a little control for the arms. And it like literally is a guy in a suit. It was like assisted Ripley by cranes. Him. Yeah, it's, it's like holding up, helping yeah. bear the weight of the actual thing. So he doesn't just like fall over. But Ripley's basically sitting on a guy's lap. Yeah, it's the- doing that. He <laughs> said, he says in the commentary, it's like a like the dad with the daughter that like walks on his feet like they're like she's sitting yeah. there and like they walk together yeah and it's <laughs> it's just it's so it's really, weird i never it's really funny that. to think about yeah it's really <laughs> funny to think about although I, I i guess i never thought like how else would you do it with pre-cgi you know yeah. you, build fucking, this thing. you build a fucking power suit <laughs> that's what you do now um <laughs> It's funny, as we've talked about this, you know, an episode and a half in now, uh, we've joked a few times about James Cameron being, having a reputation as being kind of a dick, you know, but (laughs) so far as we've discussed the, these movies so far, he seems kind of okay. You know, like maybe he's a little self-confident. You could say that he's maybe a little arrogant, but he hasn't done anything like nefarious or anything. He hasn't been really addicted to anyone in particular. His cast seems to like him. I mean, he makes friends left and right. You know, he's buddies with Lance Hendrickson, Bill Paxton. Like he's he's making friends. So like, where do all these stories come from? I feel like you're going to tell us. Well, I'm going to (laughs) say I have an idea of where that reputation began. Well, uh, let's talk about the filming of Aliens with that said. So production on Aliens took place at Pinewood Studios. Now, we've talked about Pinewood before here on the show. Uh, This is the famous soundstage where uh, it's located a little bit outside of London, where everything from The Shining to James Bond to Star Wars have been filmed. Or in the realm of movies that we've talked about on Cinema Shock, very recently uh, for one of them, Little Shop of Horrors was filmed there. Uh, And parts of The Dark Knight were filmed there as well, way Mm -hmm. back the beginning of Cinema Shock. Uh, it's this legendary studio that houses some of the largest sound stages in the world, which was a perfect environment for Cameron, uh, for the world that he was trying to create in Aliens. But it did come with a few challenges. So in, in the 80s in England, studios came with a crew attached. So meaning that if you wanted to shoot at Pinewood Studios, Pinewood Studios supplied the crews. These guys who had been working for Pinewood Studios for, for years, decades, some mm-hmm. of them. Uh, But because of this, a lot of the crew at Pinewood, they were lifers and they just viewed the job as any other job, just like they would if it was a factory job, just because they were making movies didn't matter to them. They didn't, uh, they often didn't care about the artistry going into the product. This was just a job for a worker. Might as well be working on an assembly line as a paycheck gig, nothing more. This could not be any more different than the young, passionate crews that Cameron and Heard had worked on back in their Roger Corman days and even on the Terminator. Here's what Cameron had to say. Gail and I were shocked to be working with people who simply couldn't care less about the film they were working on. The Pinewood crew were lazy, insolent, and arrogant. There were a few bright lights amongst the younger art people, but for the most part, we despised them and they despised us. So, <laughs> so the way that these crews were used to working was so different than what Cameron was used to uh, and very different from what is kind of the norm on an American film set on American film sets, crews were working 12 hours a day on average. 
Cameron was used to pushing his crew sometimes to 14 hour work days, uh, but the Pinewood guys, they were used to having breaks at 10 and at two. And then at five o'clock, they're ready to punch out and go home. And like I said, this is a, this is a factory job for them. Yep. Uh, and those two breaks, the 10 and two, those were not like lunchtime. This is tea time. Yep. This is uh, so there was a union. This, this is a union crew. And part of the union mandate was that twice a day, the doors open, doesn't matter what's happening. The doors open and a woman pushing a tea trolley would come in and the crew would just drop everything to have tea. Didn't matter if they were, if they, they're, they were in the middle of a big special effects shoot, they've got fog, sm- special effects, smoke everywhere at 10 o'clock. They're opening that door. Tea trolley comes in. All that special effects smoke has gone out the door uh, and they're having tea. I saw Peter Lamont, production designer on Octopussy, like he was a part of this. I was wondering if it had anything to do with Pinewood. I didn't have a chance to look at that, but Cameron gives him a lot of credit. But yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll talk about him extensively here in a few minutes. Oh, okay. Well, then I'll hang tight. (laughs) But yeah, I I mean, you hear any of the other actors talk about this? Like, it's just like these guys didn't know how to work. Yeah, like they were lazy, but and and, which Cameron says as well in that quote I just read. Yeah, Uh, but the, the crew also seemed to resent Cameron. Uh, at this time, when they were filming this, the Terminator had not been released in, Eng- in England yet. So they saw Cameron as this kind of young, inexperienced punk who was trying to make the sequel to a masterpiece and one that was directed by a Brit. Oh, uh, yeah. And yeah, Cameron, that'd do it. <laughs> he even tried to hold Terminator screenings for the crew to show them what he had done, but no one would show up for him. Like they just didn't care. They would not show up. Uh, they simply did not respect him. Uh, And in England, there was this sense at the time that you didn't move up the ladder based on talent. You did it by putting in your time and paying your dues. So they didn't see Cameron. They saw this 31-year-old kid who didn't deserve to direct a movie of this size because he had not paid his dues. Um, They saw Heard, who was a 29-year-old female producer who was married to the director, as kind of a joke. Um, Heard would actually, she actually said that she would, when she would like interview crew members for various positions on the set, some of them would tell her that they didn't take orders from a woman. So this is what they're dealing with. Uh, a crew that simply doesn't respect either of them at all. Wow. Contentions between this English crew and the, and Cameron and Heard kind of continued to escalate. And a lot of that conflict was due to a guy named Derek Cracknell, which is the, uh, the movie's first assistant director. Uh, now, Cracknell, he was very well respected among the crew because he had been Stanley Kubrick's assistant director, having worked on 2001 A Space Odyssey and A Clockwork Orange. Should also probably mention that he worked on Toby Hooper's Life Force as well, because that's a movie we've talked about here on the show. And this guy, man, he, he was continuously trying to undermine Cameron and Hurd's authority, deliberately setting up shots differently than how Cameron had requested because he thought that he knew better than Cameron. And honestly, it kind of seems like he probably felt that he was more qualified to direct the film than Cameron was. It was probably uh, a w- tough position for Cameron too. Cause remember how much he like idolizes 2001. Yeah, right. Imagine how shitty that feels for James Cameron. Like this, this movie 2001 that essentially compelled him to become a movie director. He loves this movie. He idolizes 2001. And the guy who was essentially like Kubrick's right hand man on that film is working on your movie. Uh, but he's an asshole. Like yeah. that's what he's dealing with. Jeez. He thinks you're a piece of shit. Right. Uh, this guy, he'd refer to Cameron as governor and Grizzly Adams because Cameron had a beard at the time. So they, they which is a dumb insult. <laughs> but, yeah. So, so he's dealing with this. And then there were also issues with the film's uh, original cinematographer, who was a veteran English uh, director of photography named Dick Bush. I got nothing. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, man, after all of that. Damn, yeah. dude. <laughs> no, let's be honest. This I don't blame Dick Bush. He's probably naturally grumpy. He's born with a lot of baggage. So <laughs> he's, he's just <laughs> it's it's a tough life. He's, a tough life. He's, from, he's from down south, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> south, south London, I believe. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, if you visit our sponsor, manscaped.com. Hey, there we go. <laughs> if, if, if only they were, that would be a perfect segue. You won't have to worry about the dick push any time in your future. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is this is uh, where we need a Ron Gronkowski going, oh, man, my English director of photography is really getting out of hand. What do I do, babe? <laughs> Oh this man, so you got to get rid of that dick bush. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> b- 
Bush's performance, among other issues, was causing Cameron and Heard to fall behind on their shooting schedule, which was already set at a very ambitious 75 days. I mean, 75 days to shoot a movie with this many special effects is already pushing it. Uh, but they were running even further behind, so they fired Bush and replaced him with Adrian Biddle. Now, Biddle, he was pretty young at the time. He was in his early 30s and had gotten to start working under Ridley Scott, actually. He'd been the director of photography for Scott's groundbreaking 1984 commercial for Apple, which, you know, aired at the uh, during the Super Bowl. It's like one of the most famous commercials of all time. Yeah, that chick uh, runs in with the big hammer and spins and throws it. And it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aliens was about four. Actually, <laughs> yes, about yes. Love and Thunder, yes. Uh, okay. The Aliens was uh, Biddle's first credit on a feature film, uh, but he would go on to have a pretty amazing career as a director of photography. Uh, he worked on movies like The Princess Bride, Willow, uh, and Event Horizon, which, you know, I, I personally love. Hey, man. Um, <laughs> I'll, not, I'll not talk shit about Event Horizon. His last credit before his death in 2005 was V for Vendetta. Mm. Uh, and if I remember correctly from that episode we did on V for Vendetta, I believe he died before the movie came out, like after shooting was done, but before the premiere of the film. Mm. It is the tough part about making all these for if anybody wonders. I always think about like experts that you see pop up on screen uh, for like a lot of these documentaries and stuff. I'm like, they had to know what they were talking about. They read a bunch of stuff again. They went back over their shit beforehand. Right. Is this the- this is too much to remember all of this because people will reference to me in my Instagram DMs. Like they'll make a joke about something. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? And it was something we talked about. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe only three episodes ago. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Oh dude. I well, the know. thing is my brain can only beers at episodes ago. Yeah. And my brain can only hold so much information. <laughs> like it has right. to expunge some of it, you know? Uh, so not long after he, um, he cut Bush out. Uh, Cameron and Heard got also gave crack. Just say it, they, they trimmed him. They they trimmed him. Yeah, he got trimmed from the crew. Uh, yeah. And they, then they also gave Cracknell his notice, which caused the crew, who remember idolized this guy, to break out into complete mutiny. Uh, all of the tension that had been building between Cameron and the crew just kind of boiled over. Oof. Uh, they actually referred to it as the tea trolley mutiny. <laughs> wow. But uh, at Cracknell's urging, in the middle of a shooting day, the Pinewood crew put down their tools and just stopped working in protest. Uh, so that's, this puts Cameron and Hurt in kind of a tight spot because there were a lot of films shooting in England at the time. So they couldn't just like hire another crew. They had to fix this. So they called Fox to try to figure out what to do. Cameron was ready to straight up move the entire production out of England which would have been logistically probably pretty difficult at this point. But Heard kind of talked him down, talked him out of that. And instead, they called a family meeting. <laughs> Cameron basically called the entire crew in, spoke to them very frankly about some of the issues that they'd been having. He said, he said to them, he said, I can't do this on my own. But I also can't have a situation where it seems like the crew is working to prove that the endeavor is going to be a failure. If you have a problem with that, you've got to step forward because we've got to replace you. And he just told him straight out, we we got to cut the shit. And this meeting lasted for hours with crew members airing their grievances over the long days, the long hours. Uh, and in the end, the uh, assistant director's crew, they agreed to be more supportive of Cameron and Cameron agreed to be a little more sensitive to their tea time. Yeah, it's tough, I guess, if that's what they're used to. But, uh, you know, the, nobody else. Uh, the cast and stuff don't have any sympathy to this. I mean, I know like uh, Bill Pullman called him as like, oh, these people have like Bill indig- Pullman. Uh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I did it on accident for real that time. <laughs> uh, Bill Paxson, he said uh, they have this real indentured servant attitude, uh, like about everything they did. Michael Bean is like, uh, you know, Heard actually gave a, a couple of times. I, I saw references to Heard giving. Uh, she she gave Bean a lot of credit, saying like your enthusiasm like really helped get us going. Like you you stayed positive constantly on set, and he was very much like because I know what this will turn out like. Like I've I know that this made my whole life. Like yeah. you know the last movie, you know like really nailed it for made me. his career. Yeah, yeah. yeah so he's <laughs> like, so I get it. He's like, I'm I'm fine. He's like, they they just don't understand 14 hour days and yeah that's part of this process but i don't know it's part of making a move yeah 
And, and Cameron, even after this meeting, after even after they kind of agreed to get along, they, they still never really got along. <laughs> like they never really like warmed to each other, you know, but they were able to reconcile enough to finish the movie. And then on the last day of the shoot, Cameron gathered the crew once more. You know, the directors always give this big speech when it's the last day of the shoot, thanking everyone you know, for all their hard work. And he, he, he brings them in and he says, this is, this is a quote. This has been a long and difficult shoot fraught by many problems. But the one thing that kept me going through it all was the certain knowledge that one day I would drive out of the gates of Pinewood and never come back and that you sorry bastards would still be here. <laughs> Now he's like a regular General Patton. This guy. he's like a, he's like a regular Bill <laughs> President Bill Pullman, President Bill Paxton. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> now, you made me thinking to yourself because this is what I thought is that it doesn't really sound like Cameron's being a dick. It kind of sounds like his crew was being a bunch of dicks, right? Is that how that reads to you? Yeah, uh, I, that's what it kind of that's how it came across to me. But I do think that this situation. The, the T-Trolley mutiny. I think this is the beginning of Cameron's reputation as some sort of totalitarian. Uh, so we'll see how this grows among further films. But in this case, and granted, you know, we're not necessarily getting every side of the story. The, the, the um, you know, the books and, and interviews I read that references, they're not interviewing any of these crew members. They're interviewing Paxton, Michael Bean, they're, they're, James Cameron. They're interviewing the guys on Cameron's side, not necessarily the other guys. So obviously there's two sides to every story, but to me, it seems like these guys were set in their ways and they didn't like this young yank, even though he wasn't a yank and they saw him as a yank coming in and telling them what to do and telling them to do th things differently than how they'd been used to doing them for years. Mm. But I mean, it, I, I guess to try to play devil's advocate for a second, as much as, as, as deep as, and broad as Cameron's knowledge of film production and the industry in general, you'd think he would have kind of known that of kind of, of kind of like, Hey, this is kind of how things work at Pinewood. Yeah. It's, I don't know, man. I mean, he's not like a film historian or anything like he's very, he knows all the roles. He knows how to do different technical jobs, but he's not like, he'd never been to England. He'd never been to yeah. Pinewood or worked there. And he, he'd only worked on one movie set as a director. He'd only worked on a handful of movie sets at all, yeah, you know, that's true. and the ones that's he had true. worked on had been very small, very low budget. They certainly weren't shooting on the most famous soundstage in the world. So it's a right. very different <laughs> world that he's been kind of thrown into. Yeah. Uh, and, and not all of the film scenes were shot at Pinewood. A lot of them were like, you know, the, um, the, the, planet exterior things like that or those were all shot on pinewood uh but for the alien queen's nest uh production designer peter lamont found a decommissioned coal plant in west london that would be a perfect environment to use and cameron loved it because it had like these these like walkways with grates you know that he could shoot through and have light going through uh yeah. it was like perfect for what he wanted uh it's a, it's a and it is a great outstanding set i think so uh but a quick note on lamont Real, real quick, because I said we'd talk about him. Uh, Peter Lamont, he had been working in the British film industry in some form or another since the late 1940s. But when I look at his history, what's most impressive to me is how many James Bond movies he worked on. Uh, <laughs> his first job on a James Bond movie was on 1964's Goldfinger, the third James Bond movie, uh, where he worked as a draftsman. Uh, so basically he's designing things mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't have a credit on that your draftsmen don't typically get credits on films but that 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 was his first official job on a bond movie but he would go on to work on 18 bond movies Whoa. usually <laughs> as usually as either an art director or a production designer he worked on every bond movie from goldfinger to casino royale with the sole exception of tomorrow never dies oh, wow he worked on every single one from from connery to daniel craig isn't that wild? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Holy crap. <laughs> that is wild to me. Uh, man, he, but uh, an amazing career. But anyway, back to Alien. So he, uh, Peter Lamont found this perfect space that Cameron loved. And it had just one problem. It was completely covered in asbestos, <laughs> which they had to clean. Uh, the air had to be cleared of contaminants. And then the air quality had to be tested multiple times a day to make sure they weren't like killing the cast and the crew. Uh, and 
to further turn it into the kind of gross gooey alien nest that we see in the film, Stan Winston and his crew had to cover the set in alien slime, which they basically just created by smearing KY jelly on everything. <laughs> can you imagine your, if you're, work. can you imagine if you're like, they got the guy accepting the mail that day and just like <laughs> this pallets of KY jelly come in. I mean, I was going to say, to be fair, I mean, addressed to Stan Winston is like, Hey, what is, what is Stan getting up to tonight? <laughs> no, I was going to say, this is how I live most of my life. Is, <laughs> that's how I handle most problems. Is <laughs> just smear just KY just jelly. Smear KY on Look, everything. Smear some KY all over your dick bush and just... <laughs> oh, <laughs> that would be... God. That sounds incredibly uncomfortable. And messy. open the doors and have tea time, baby. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> so Lamont used his expertise to find other use items for the production as well, including the undercarriage of an old Vulcan helicopter that was transformed into the Marines dropship and a tow truck that British Airways had used to tow 747s. Uh, that, that's their like vehicle that they used to uh, to transport the Marines from the dropship into the into the the building you know that yeah yeah, thing yeah. That, that they go riding on later that it's was it's a badass vehicle it's, it's really cool, cool but that was an originally a tow truck that British Airways used and it was used to tow airplanes so this thing is incredibly heavy so they actually had to like reinforce the floors or any anywhere in the studio that it was going to drive on had to be reinforced because it was so heavy because it's such oh, a wow. strong vehicle to yeah. be able to pull airplanes yeah. I didn't see the uh Vulcan helicopter come up at uh everybody at Star Trek Todd. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> uh, and Lamont's knack for reusing found items came in handy when it was time to uh, to film the scene where Ripley and the Marines come out of hypersleep. So uh, by this point in the production, uh, they were running out of money. <laughs> and Heard and Fox decided that this scene could just be cut. We don't need it. Let's cut it out. Uh, but it was essentially the, the reason they wanted to cut it is because they didn't have the money to build a set. They didn't have the money to build this big hypersleep room. So it was really just a production design issue. And Lamont wanted to try to figure it out. And he came up with a solution based on a pretty old fashioned idea. Instead of building this huge set full of hypersleep chambers, he would just build four chambers. And then he stuck a mirror in there to make the Sulaco seem enormous. And you can, and I, I watched the movie again after finding this out and you can kind of, you can kind of tell if you're looking for it, but if you're not looking for it, it's seamless. Uh, wow. and so, so, cause I think there are, there are eight, there are eight hypersleep pods in that, but the, the back four are just a reflection of the first four and you yeah. would never know. It's pretty so cool. Crazy. Awesome. <laughs> and I, lo I love that idea because it seems like the kind of, kind of idea that would come from a Roger Corman veteran, not an established Pinewood studios journeyman, you know, uh, it seems like the kind of solution you'd have, you'd have to make on a low budget Roger Corman set. Uh, so it seemed like with Lamont, Cameron had kind of found an ally amongst these Pinewood uh, crew members, you know, which is probably why he later brought him back for True Lies. And he actually brought him out of retirement for Titanic, uh, a movie for which Lamont won his first and only Oscar. Nice. nice. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. I, that's why I wanted to mention him earlier. He gives him credit for a lot of conce conceptual design, like in, in interviews I, I read along with, uh, you know the the other guys we talked about i don't know there were there were still some really clever things going on with these i mean what one of the things i never even thought about before but if you think about uh, sorry if i'm jumping around here but like in alien think about when we talked about that with uh uh dan o'bannon like you know the initial xenomorph was like a seven foot tall dude <laughs> like in yeah. a costume you know yeah and uh, they couldn't find a bunch of seven foot tall guys for this. Uh, and so they used like these, I mean, they, they hired like stunt performers and stuff so that, uh, cause generally the humans and the xenomorphs wouldn't be seen in the same frame anyway. And honestly, even in the original alien, you can never really tell how tall he is like that, that sort, I mean, that's a cool bit of trivia about that movie, but it doesn't really matter in, in the original alien. Like you can't ever really tell how tall that, that xenomorph is. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, you know, there, there, there was all this stuff like that happened. I mean, so, so the Roger Corbin school of thought is not lost. I mean, you know, we mentioned earlier, like the steady cam mounts being used for the machine right, guns yeah. and, and that stuff. I mean, the, the Velcro, by the way, on the steady cams kept falling apart. And so they had to actually like duct tape these people to the mount to like <laughs> carry the guns 
So like Rolston, they were apparently really heavy too. Yeah, I was gonna say Rolston and Goldstein said later that they were like taped to these smart goods for so long they were having like nightmares about them. Jeez. Um, <laughs> uh, what one interesting little, you know, random tidbit I thought was uh, the alien nest that's uh there it was uh later used for the axis chemical set for batman uh oh no shit nice yeah, they said when the batman crew first got there they found like most of the nest was still intact like that's they just, fun yeah <laughs> just a random bit of trivia that's fun so when it came time to edit the movie cameron hired another kubrick alum a guy named ray lovejoy who was the editor of 2001 a space odyssey but and kind of another example of the uh, what I, I'm seeing as a the whole the old never meet your heroes idiom, you know, <laughs> this didn't quite work out the way that Cameron won. Like he was really excited to have this guy who edited 2001 working on his film. Uh, and Lovejoy is a great editor, uh, but he was used to the edit uh, editing films at kind of a, a very different pace than what Cameron wanted. Cameron liked quick editing, especially in his action, action sequences where he would insert blank flash frames uh, to kind of accelerate the tempo. So you'd have like a single frame here and there where it's just flashing white, often while, uh, you know, while guns are being shot. Uh, and it, it just kind of keeps the action moving. Uh, but at a time when editing took place manually in an editing bay where film had to be physically cut and spliced back together, putting a frame or two of white into a scene was painstaking work. Oh, and it's funny you should mention Batman, Gary, because Ray Lovejoy edited Batman. Oh, oh that's wild. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I did a not couple, know that. A couple years after this, Ray Lovejoy edited Batman as well. Editing and other post-production delays put the film either even further behind schedule, which caused an issue for the film's composer, James Horner. I was honestly expecting um, Todd to have already mentioned James Horner because... Uh, uh, yeah. James Horner, uh, who's a, a legendary film composer, one of his most well, one of his many well-known scores was Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan, uh, and you know, uh, and he did Star Trek III as well. He did he did those back to back. So oh, yeah. I, I was expecting him to be on Star Trek, but maybe you didn't use him because he was not a cast member. So. Yeah, I tend to focus on the cast members. <laughs> yeah, it's when but, it's when there's nobody in the cast that I start scrolling through the entire crew. Yeah, but. <laughs> But James Horner has worked on Star Trek a couple of times and, nice. and done some great work. But he started his career working on low budget fare, uh, kicking off the 80s with a duo of Roger Corman produced films. He did Humanoids from the Deep and he did Galaxy of Terror, which, as we know, also employed a young James Cameron. Uh, uh. But, dude, James Horner, like, look at his filmography. Like, when you get done watching, listening to this episode, just go look him up on IMDb. Like, it is one of the most legendary careers you'll ever see from a composer. I mean, he he get, he went on to score uh, Walter Hill's 48 Hours, uh, Willow, Field of Dreams, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, The Rocketeer, Hocus Pocus, Braveheart, Apollo 13, Jumanji. Like, I can't name all the films that he has composed that you're familiar with. Basically, this guy created the background music for your entire childhood. That's awesome. what he did. So uh, he's amazing. And his work here, is uh is good but it's not his best work i think and i think that's because of the time constraints that he had on it uh so by the time that ray lovejoy had locked in reels for horner to compose it was less than two weeks before the scheduled scoring session with the london symphony orchestra uh which was cut down from the original seven weeks of prep time that he was supposed to have but because ray lovejoy had taken so long to edit then he didn't have a movie to score to. And they'd already hired the London Symphony Orchestra. So they couldn't just cancel the session without forfeiting their entire fee uh, that, they had, that they had paid to hire them. And this naturally caused a lot of tension, but it caused a lot of tension between Horner and Cameron uh, because they didn't really know how to work with each other at this time. They're both very early in their career. Cameron had never worked with an orchestral composer before. Uh, Brad Fidel, who had done the score for Terminator, did it solo on a synthesizer, mostly uh, on a synthesizer, but he, he didn't have like a big orchestra. Uh, and, and Horner had worked on some movies, but he hadn't worked with a lot of directors yet at this point. So they're both feel very, they're both young and dumb and well, they're not dumb, but you know, they're both young and fairly inexperienced working with, a, with the other like this. Uh, so this caused a lot of tension between them, but of course the two would learn to work together better later on because Horner returned to score both Titanic and Avatar down the line. 
Nice. Yeah, I mean, he 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 talks about that he was a little disappointed with this one because of the timing and everything like that. Um, you know, he 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 says he reused uh, several scores. I, actually, the reason I knew uh, what you were talking about Star Trek is he mentions he used. Um, I want to say it was from Star Trek two II and three. There are some like beats from both of those soundtracks that he reuses in this movie or something like that. I want to say it was at least wrath of Khan. He said he, he had to, yeah. Wrath of Khan had, he had already done by this point because wrath of Khan was 82. Yeah. And then maybe it was something he was planning on for three or something. I, I don't remember. He, he talked about a lot of stuff. He was having to like build off of other stuff. He already had made uh, right. to, to make this and, and, and Ray Lovejoy, uh, you know, like you said, he was used to a slow pace. He had done like 2001 A Space Odyssey and, you know, camera was going to fire him and, and considered uh, Mark Goldblatt from The Terminator. Lovejoy, apparently during this, like he had uh, grabbed all of the footage from a story I read, uh, especially during the final battle, which was like a big deal. Uh, he said that he was going to get fired. He was going to bring on like Mark Goldblatt or uh, Peter Boyetta, who'd uh, who had already been brought on to edit like the more dialogue driven scenes or whatever. Uh, Ray Lovejoy like stole all the footage and uh, locked himself in an <laughs> editing suite over a weekend and uh, like edited everything uh, by himself and then brought it out and showed it to Cameron uh, the next week. And uh, it worked because Cameron, <laughs> Cameron actually was impressed and was like, all right, fine. They just had a light of fire under him, I guess. Yeah. And uh, he said he just uh, allowed him to stay on board and uh, supervise the final edit and all of that. And, and it worked. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, Lovejoy is going to later receive an Oscar nomination for best film editing. For yeah. This movie. So. But even with a finished film, Cameron still ran into a few difficulties. His movie, for one, was way too long, uh, clocking in at nearly two hours and 45 minutes. And he couldn't really decide where to make the cuts. So Gail Ann Hurd actually made a bold suggestion. She, she recommended cutting the film's entire third reel, which is the part of the film where Ripley's daughter is revealed and the LV-426 colony is shown before the aliens attack. We actually meet Newt much earlier on in the film. Mm. Uh, so that's what they did. They cut it completely. They cut the entire reel out. Uh, and along with a few other cuts here and there, uh, throughout the film but that was the big chunk of it and that paired the film down to two hours and 17 minutes which is still long but it was a link that they could convince the studio to release and when the film was released on july 18th 1986 it did gangbusters business uh, bringing in over 130 million dollars worldwide it remained the highest grossing film in the alien franchise until alien covenant was released in 2017 although i did the math and if you adjust it for inflation aliens actually beats covenant by about 50 million dollars nice so, so technically if you go by inflation aliens is still the highest grossing film in the entire aliens franchise that's Whatever. awesome <laughs> yeah it, it also received i generally... say prometheus is the <laughs> no, Prometheus did poorly. Shut, I mean, shut your, <laughs> shut your whore mouth. <laughs> yeah, I fucking hate that movie. Uh, <laughs> uh, it also received generally positive reviews from critics. Uh, Gary, w we were talking, I can't remember if this was actually in our episode or if it was just me and you talking off mic, but you mentioned to me the Roger Ebert review for Alien, so I'm just going to read a little bit of it here. Uh, the whole review is honestly worth reading because it's a really fun review. It is a fantastic uh, review. But, uh, but here's... My favorite quote from it, from Roger Eber, he said he gave it three and a half stars, I believe. Uh, and he said, the movie made me feel bad. It filled me with feelings of unease and disquiet and anxiety. I walked outside and I didn't want to talk to anyone. I was drained. I'm not sure aliens is what we mean by entertainment. Yet I have to be accurate about this movie. It is a superb example of filmmaking craft. And the whole review reads like that. The whole review is him going... <laughs> Oh man, this movie is like really well made and really good, but I didn't like it is basically what he's saying, but he still gives it three and a half stars because he admits like how well made it, it was, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. he, he describes it. He describes fucking aliens as though like the first time I watched martyrs 
or something. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like you felt bad about being alive a as a person. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I <laughs> kind of wish I was dead, but <laughs> right. it's a good movie. It did yeah. its job. It's, yeah. It did what it was supposed to do. Uh, it sounds to me reading that review, like maybe Roger Ebert, after seeing Aliens, could have used a nap. <laughs> No, one hundred percent sure. Roger Ebert could have used a map, and and God, let me tell you something. Uh, there are so many people that had <laughs> negative things to say about aliens. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna talk some of the, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to you zennials for a second. You seem to have a hatred for James Cameron, and I don't know why that is. But fucking stop it. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand it. I really don't. And, like, I don't understand why why people have a hate on for for him because his movies are generally almost almost. I mean, I would say all of them are are pretty good on, on one level or another. Like, I, I'm gonna say this, Justin. And you're gonna hate this, and I, I'm gonna say this, but it, it almost feels like uh, to an extent, like it's like. Oh God, I'm gonna hate myself for saying this. I'm gonna say it <laughs> now. I gotta hear it. <laughs> I, I wanted to say, like, he almost feels like people are trying to turn him to like the imagined dragons of like movie making. Like, <laughs> no, you imagine dragons. <laughs> no, it's just that that like he like well crafts, like he creates hits, and, like people are like, "Fuck you." For- <laughs> For knowing exactly what people want to hear and using it commercially, <laughs> you're just like <laughs> it, it, it. It in that sense, it feels like the same thing to me um, so far. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, and and again, and I'm not like some huge Imagine Dragons fan or anything. I'm just oh, saying, no, they're I, like every awful. song I've heard from Imagine <laughs> Dragons, I've been like, yeah, it's catchy. Whatever. No, I. I mean, I hate Imagine Dragons because, but, but so many people hate Imagine Dragons, and I'm like, they're ta- no, they just know how to write songs that are number one songs. Yeah. I just feel like Imagine Dragons. This is not a music podcast, but I feel like they they write every every song to be in a car commercial. Yeah, well, I don't. <laughs> I'm not saying that I feel like James Cameron's much different. Like I feel like James Cameron's like I want to be crafty. I want to be okay. I'll, I'll give him this. He does have a passion, and he is an artist. I'm not taking that away from him, but he also seems to like every movie. He he knows, like he's just like, no, this will work. Yeah, this will fucking this will make money. Like this is this is what these motherfuckers want, and I'm gonna give it to them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a talent. I mean, there's there's respect to be given there. But anyway. The point is, is that there's a lot of reviews I could go through that are people that just hate James Cameron. I'm not going to do that here. I've got to be better about on the somebody needs a nap to get really down and dirty on the people that really should fucking take a nap. Um, <laughs> it's hard on James Cameron, but I'm going to try. So let's get started. Donald King says, really, Scott, what's made a brilliant sci fi film called Alien. Many years later, he made an equally brilliant prequel called Prometheus. <laughs> I already know I lost Justin. Oh. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> In the years between, people tried to make their own sequels. One of these people was a man called James Cameron. First, he decided to make his version sentimental by introducing an irritating child that kept screaming so Ripley could say dumb shit to reassure it. Fortunately, David Fincher had the brat killed off in his version. Wow. Cameron also decided he would have the film dominated by a group of U.S. Marines. These Marines were to have co- the combined IQ of about minus five. All the Marines said things like, let's go. Oh, my God. And what is that? Most irritating of all was Bill Paxton. Shame on you, Bill. He ended every sentence with the word, man, irritating. <laughs> Fortunately. For the viewer, the alien soon disemboweled him. The heroine of the film was to be given lines just as bad as the Marines. The aliens were not scary, no matter how many there were. The spaceships looked secondhand. The Marines shot at the aliens with their huge we- weaponry. Lance Henderson got his head blown off, but he carried on talking. Happily, when the Marines were killed, death applied to their tonsils too. After this success, Mr. Cameron got to make a three-hour-long film about a ship that was perfectly designed, and it sank, too. I hate that. (laughs) 
<laughs> uh, Harry Plakett says, it's evil. This film is outright evil. These are images that belong in hell, and no decent human should recreate them or watch them. If you do watch it, your soul will suffer. Wow, is, it, is this guy like <laughs> just saying that? As, is he just being like very, uh, I don't know what the word is, but is he, is he real? Is he being for real? <laughs> I don't <laughs> that's, that's know. That's my question. Is that, the, remember the guy from last week that was called John 316 talking oh, about yeah. <laughs> Terminator being a porno? <laughs> uh, let's see here. Here is D Getz. My brother loved it. This is one star. <laughs> Wait, I just had to get this one. One star. Aliens was a hit is the title of this review. My brother loved it. He already has the first Alien movie. This is one of his favorite movies. Thank you. (laughs) I have to add those in because I'm just like, this fucking gave this a one star review. (laughs) Stupid. Uh, People Uh, don't know how the star rating works, right, Todd? Yeah, a bunch of dummies. (laughs) I appreciate your patience, Todd. I'm going to continue on with Cornelius, who says, uh, very disappointing. James Cameron is no Ridley Scott. The script by Cameron used a stock character speaking in melodramatic, cliched language, poor storytelling, and everything is a retread from Alien. A great film. Oh, I think he said Alien is a great film. Uh, Alien, a great film. Save your time and money on this clunker. Cameron focuses on the technology and special effects, but leaves a huge hole in his film due to lame screenplay. What about Becky? She says, in this conservative cultural backlash from the 1980s, our badass practical heroine has to become a mommy who calls other strong female characters a sexist slur. Also, Vasquez is a white woman in brown face. She's not wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Watch says, holy shit, this sucked. Boring, repetitive. It goes on for way too long. It's like a bad version of Alien and Avatar. By the way, I think this is his first attempt at making Avatar because half the props are the same. That's what he said. What? I don't get that at all. What? That's what he said. That's what he fucking said. What is uh, that? What was he talking about? I didn't realize because, I had so I mean, there movies. are power loaders in Avatar, but they're military style. But other than that, and, uh, and the inclusion of a, of a Sigourney Weaver, who is not a prop, <laughs> I don't know what they're yeah. talking about. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know I have a lot of these, but let's keep going. Uh, what about Lunchbox, who says, had a sudden urge to watch this while cutting radishes from my salad this morning. I spent my lunches in the first week of ninth grade fixed up by Ritlin and trying to do the knife trick with a ballpoint pen. By the end of the week, my left hand was all flaps of skin, blue and red with ink and blood. The high school guidance counselor was worried that I had been demonstrating some form of psychosis, but I assured him, I'm just trying to do the knife thing from Aliens. He seems satisfied. This movie rules, but it sucks. What? <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like, and this is not necessarily with that one. I mean, that, that guy's clearly just trying to be funny. But you you, you mentioned the, the Zennials, I guess, earlier, and it made me think a lot of the people, especially on Letterboxd, um, I feel like a lot of people are just trying to be witty in their reviews without taking any sort of the actual quality of the film into account. Does that make sense? It's mm. true. The, these last few, including that one, are from Letterbox. So Letterbox is using my, my last hit. And uh, so, like, for instance, this here from uh, Josh, you give that a half star who said, no, fuck that little girl. <laughs> well, that's just mean. <laughs> Would you leave her to die? That's rude. Here's uh, Aled, who gives it a half star and says, uh, I forgot how shitty this is. I struggle to understand how someone could take everything good about Alien and throw it to one side in favor of an annoyingly American war slash action movie. Exceptions are the scenes with the face hugger and the ceiling bit. The ceiling bit? That's what the they said. Yeah, where he, he pokes his head up and they're all crawling yeah, that's, towards that, it. that is good it's like some yeah, like, like it. cockroaches coming at you yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh this is uh sue who says ah for like four lines it says what a fucking travesty it looks like a pay-per-view porno parody holy fuck so lame i'm calling for a 10th crusade to reclaim alien from james cameron's hat figures I hate I hate everything about this. <laughs> <laughs> this half star from Jack. He says such an awful movie in every way. Boring, unoriginal, badly made. This whole goddamn movie looks like a Universal Studios ride. Why are the actors staged in a conga line, bruh? 
bruh, I want a laser tag like this for my birthday. Cardboard Batmobile, Play-Doh practical effects, Reebok shoe close-up count, three. Dude, that's just somebody trying to be funny. And like the the idea of saying that this, regardless of what you think of this movie, and, and generally most people think it is a masterpiece. Uh, <laughs> uh, to say that it's badly made is yeah, like what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> 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 all right, two more, two more real quick. Uh, here's a half star for Ben who says, you all deserve jail time for convincing me, convincing me this movie was supposed to be a masterpiece. This is embarrassing. It's embarrassingly terrible. It's beyond terrible. I'm in disbelief. I started it last night and turned it off after an hour, but I finished it just now only so I could move on with the rest of the series. And I liked the rest of these films, the ones I've seen at least. Alien is among my favorite horror movies. It's honestly among my favorite movies in general. And I dig Prometheus and Covenant. And I know it's not a movie, but Alien Isolation is super underrated. This, however, feels like it's from a completely different series. Some of this might come down to me just not liking James Cameron. Aside from Terminator and T2 to a much lesser extent, I think he's a total hack. And this movie is so, so dumb. It looks cheap and awful. It's boring. The action is lame. The dialogue is a joke. The set design is garbage. There's just nothing here that's even mildly worthwhile. It completely shits all over the first movie, not only turning a masterpiece of tension and horror into an action movie, but turning it into a terrible action movie. It's like someone made an action sequel to The Shining. It sucked and then somehow became more beloved than the original. Maybe things were different when this came out. Maybe I'm missing something. I know I'm probably wrong since everybody seems to love this film, but I'm writing this off as complete cheap garbage for now and i won't be revisiting this for a long time these reviews are giving me a headache this is uh (laughs) first of all that guy shitting on this movie and and then immediately praising prometheus and covenant uh means that they they clearly have horrible tastes and also (laughs) like the idea of saying that this is a bad movie because it's so stylistically differently from the first, but then praising the later movies. Have you seen alien three? Have you seen alien resurrection? The the unique thing about the alien franchise is especially in those first four is that every movie feels completely different because they, they get yeah. these directors who have a very unique vision to take over every single time. And that's one thing I like about this franchise so much, honestly, because it's like uh, letting other like very, talented auteur type directors play in the sandbox that is the world that Ridley Scott and Dan O'Bannon created in the first film. Mm. I'm not going to disagree with that, but for the final, uh, this is from Canon history. I assume not like Canon movies actually. Um, Probably not. They give it a half star, Uh, but Canon history who really, really needs a nap says, I hate this movie. I wish it didn't exist. I despise it. I loathe it. I abhor it. James Cameron, fuck you, took everything that made the original Alien a great film and threw it away like it didn't matter. I don't care if this is technically a good movie. They did it with like all the caps and like... Yeah, like the Spongebob meme, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I don't care if this is technically a good movie. It mangled and destroyed everything the original stood for. I didn't just fucking spit on Rickley Scott's masterpiece. I shat on it. I've dipped my toes in the alien community and it shows just how much this disgrace has ruined a potentially niche fan group. Now every piece of media, but alien isolation, God bless that game has followed the ig, ig, ignominious, oh, this guy's already smarter than me, ignominious <laughs> shadow of this revolting sequel. I truly enjoyed the action sequences and the re- relationship between Ripley and Newt is awesome. However, if only it wasn't this movie, wherefore out will God forsake us with such a tragedy? If only... Wherefore out did Doth have to best this one 
Wherefore, couldn't best something else? Oh, the misery. Thine shan't look upon thee, but with the seldom passion of misprize. Truly, this is an example of a horrible miscalculation. Every night, I cry in bed thinking of this movie. It has destroyed all I hold dear, lest we forget. You know, when someone comes up with just like this ruined fandom or this ruined my yeah, childhood, or whatever, I'm always like, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I feel so bad for you that your life is so shallow <laughs> that you have nothing else going on in your life that a sequel of, of something or a remake or a reboot yeah. or whatever ruined your childhood like yeah it, it makes me think of that, that um, fragile like maybe pick yeah. something else makes me think of that um episode of south park where they talk about raping their childhood you know yes. with with indiana jones <laughs> uh four i think it was but yeah, yeah fuck that guy because i i'm with todd that's exactly what i was thinking throughout that review is that this guy's just he's shitting on it because he even admits that it's a well-made movie and then he likes some of the character development but he doesn't like the direction that it takes because it's not the same movie that ridley scott made who the fuck wants to watch the same movie twice like i don't i i will never understand people who want the sequel to a, a successful movie to just be the same movie all over again that doesn't make any yeah. sense to me just watch the original movie i don't need to see it again <laughs> you know that doesn't make any sense and and aliens to, I, I don't think this, and this is not just my opinion, this is kind of general consensus, I think. It's in contention, it's one of the greatest sequels of all time. Uh, it is the godfather two of genre movies, I think. Uh, I mean, I personally, I prefer the Lovecraftian haunted house dread of Ridley Scott's original movie. Uh, but I can't deny that this is an absolutely masterfully made sequel. It's a great film. I, I can still prefer the original and still say and still admit that this is a great movie you know why, well, why can't is, you have both for, yeah you you can't have both and 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 the thing is is like this this movie goes back to the um i, I mean you know i i don't want to say imagine dragons cuz i don't really like imagine dragons but <laughs> but my point is is that when this movie came out james cameron at least nailed down one thing and he he took this thing and he built a, a, a world around what Ridley Scott started with, which was he, well, we he built about a whole earlier. Wor world around a concept. Right. Ridley Scott took Ridley a concept Scott's that was movie. like started and ended in a spaceship. And right. James Cameron like built a whole universe like a, right. a, around that thing. And, and it worked. Fuck you people that don't know this, but. No, I mean, well, some of you are too young to appreciate this, but they made fucking toys out of this. They made like yeah. fucking mm -hmm. like this Absolutely. thing was huge. I had this some thing of them. was a big deal yeah. and, and it works. And, and a lot of the things, despite what you want to think, a lot of the things that you think you know about Alien or that you just take with a great assault or or that you take as a given that are part of the alien uh, continuity. I think come from James Cameron's version more so yeah. than uh, Ridley Scott's version. The Ridley idea Scott's of the queen. Was, I mean, yeah. in, like I said earlier, Ripley's entire backstory, uh, right. like the, the whole universe. Cause like, I mean, Ridley Scott definitely created the foundation for that. I mean, you know, with the, the, the world, the, the type of universe that he built this lived in dirty universe that didn't feel like, uh, sorry, Todd, but does, doesn't feel like Star Trek, you know, it's very lived in. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. th and that that's a great building block. Uh, and Cameron isn't, he isn't shitting on that movie. He's building upon what Scott did. If anything, this movie proves just how good of a foundation that Scott created with the first film. He did exactly what you're supposed to do if you take something like this and you're an actual auteur filmmaker. Is Make it your own. Like, here's, here's the thing. Uh, this person made this these succinct like details about what is in this universe i'm going to take the yeah. bare bones of that and do whatever i fucking want after and james cameron did that with this movie yeah. and and he did he built upon it and and i still say even to this day things that people think about with the alien franchise come from a, a lot of this movie i mean mm -hmm. it, it i don't know it's disappointing to see so many people hating on it because 
I mean, if you if gun to head, you made me pick a movie. I'm still going to pick Alien. Honestly, I'm still going to pick Alien. But, um, but this movie's a lot of fun to me. Yeah. <laughs> like I mean, that, that's why I kind of I kind of jokingly said it was the Godfather two of genre movies because I. I Godfather 2 is one of the only sequels in history that could be in contention of as being as good or close to as good as the original. Uh, I mean, there obviously there are exceptions. I think, you know, people would say Empire Strikes Back, things like that. But for the there, most there, there's part, there's a few like you can nail down like it's Empire Strikes Back. It's I, I would say Terminator 2. Everybody says yeah. Terminator 2 is better, but fuck it. I like Terminator. But anyway. But even even if you say that Terminator 2 is better than Terminator or that Terminator is better than Terminator 2, you still have to admit that Terminator 2 is still, as among sequels, a pretty damn good one. Yeah. Uh, and in contention for that, just like this is in contention for being a great, one of the, the best sequels. I don't think it's as good as Scott's original, just because I prefer that type of movie to this type of movie. Well, and it proves like, James Cameron doesn't rest on uh, just pre-established bullshit that works right. he like wants to build on it he's like oh yeah, this he was a good idea let's see how i can take this further. and bring bring your own ideas into it he turned alien into a james cameron movie you know yeah. and that's what that's what we want i mean sometimes that works out sometimes it doesn't i i personally have a a soft spot for alien resurrection uh i would never say that that's a great movie but I like the audacity of getting Jean-Pierre Jeunet in there and making a fucking Jean-Pierre Jeunet movie uh, grafted onto an alien movie because it's fascinating to me. It doesn't always work. It, it mostly doesn't work, but it's, it's a, a fascinating watch because I'd rather watch someone with a unique vision like that come in and work on a sequel than just some like journeyman director or even oftentimes the original director who comes back and tries to do the same thing all over. You know, that's no fun to me. Uh, even when, even if it's a failure, it's a, um, a, it can be a fascinating failure, but Aliens is no failure. Aliens is, is a impeccably made film. One of the best movies of the 80s. No, no, Aliens is one of the movies of the 80s that c completely did the Batman thing and uh, it fucking, I mean, it made a toy line. It made like everybody, people today, I mean, you, you know more about the Xenomorph than you ever thought you would because of or aliens should. existing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's just, it's just that way. It's tough. I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, he said, I, I saw a quote with him. He said, uh, what we did was you tried to deflect any possible criticism by making the film in our style, making it more thematically consistent with Terminator than with alien. Like he knew what he had, uh, but he was still trying to do James Cameron on this yeah. thing. And, yeah. and that's what you should do if you're going to. And if he had tried to do what Ridley Scott, then then people would just be shitting on him for trying to, for, for copying Ridley Scott. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I, I, I think that, so the Terminator kind of proved Cameron's resourcefulness and his ability to deliver a, a masterpiece on a small budget, but aliens proves that he can work on a big budget, work within the studio and still managed to have his vision mostly intact. It, it also proves that, uh, this is, sounds like hyperbole, but I think it also proves that he's one of the best directors of action that has ever lived. Uh, because the way that he shoots the action in Aliens is pretty incredible. It, it, once the shit hits the fan, uh, which is about an hour into the movie, it does not let up until the final credits roll. Yeah. It moves on. I mean, it is it is relentlessly paced that something Some, happens. Something dire is happening in yeah every Constant, minute after constantly. a certain point yeah <laughs> yeah but what really struck me this time when i watched it because it's been a, a few years since i watched this what really struck me this time is just how much build-up there is before any, any of that even happens uh in, in the theatrical cut it's a full hour into the film before we ever see a xenomorph uh, it's even longer in the director's cut although you do, do see a face hugger earlier on in the in the director's cut it, and luckily he's filled the film with great memorable characters we've already talked about the great marines you know bill paxton uh ripley's uh, surrogate daughter newt michael bean like these are all characters you care about uh, you've got paul riser's you know company man who's kind of a slime ball don't really care about him but uh still adds to the overall tapestry of what the he, film is he, he's a great character to hate <laughs> he really is yeah yeah he really is and, and cameron builds up this sense of impending dread throughout the movie uh what one thing i really like that he does is that the the motion detector that they use 
Yeah. That like, cl- that like kind of clicking noise, beeping noise that it makes. Yeah. It's like a ticking time bomb. Yeah. You know, and it, and it, things it, it, it made me it, think of Dunkirk, like the way that the, uh, the, the music and that feels like a ticking time bomb. You're, you're leading towards something and you're waiting for it to explode. One of the things that never gets enough credit that I swear to God, for even since I was a kid that I always think about, and maybe it's just me, but has always been that they had the robot turrets that could go out there and shoot the mm-hmm. aliens. And, and it gives you like such a uh, idea of how many there are and how yeah. fucked you are. Cause you're seeing the, the ammo coming. go down. Yeah. And you see the ammo go down. I've yeah. never forgotten that from yeah. like when mm-hmm. I was a little kid, I'm just like, always like, Oh, Ooh, y'all they, they find they have these things. And I'm like, that's so cool. Like you got the turrets and then they're just like, okay, they keep shooting and yeah. they keep coming. And then they're out of <laughs> like, ammo. We're just like, God damn it. Like yeah. it's just that they never stop. <laughs> well, it was like, nice while it lasted. And all of that, all of that does, all, all, all of what that's doing is building towards this moment where all hell breaks loose. And when it does, like it's palpable because you've been building up for an hour, hour plus. Yep. Uh, and you, and not only that, but you've learned to, you've been living with these characters that whole time. Mm-hmm. So you're, you, you have kind of a sense of like, you care if something happens to them. There's also not enough respect given to the idea that Cameron built this whole other um, side of the aliens. Um, as far as, I mean, if you connect it back to the Vietnam style thing and uh you know i'm just saying i mean when you hear soldiers describe the situation like they're going in all like uh, armor to the gills and like ammoed out but then these people just appear out of bushes or yeah. they just like they just show up there's like aliens peeling off the walls i like, love that scene so much when, that, when you first see that full xenomorph coming out of the wall yeah, uh, it's it just like every fucked time. up. You're not ready yeah. for that. You're not mm-hmm. ready for like the stuff they have. And to think about that, uh, uh, I never thought about it till we were talking about it. Honestly, this time that it really is that <laughs> kind of a similar com- comparison in that these humans are fucking invading their territory now. They, yeah. they you know, say what you will about imperialism or whatever. They're there. They took over. Like the the colonists yeah. are there. The aliens won. The aliens. This is this is now their world, and now you're the invading force. Like you're yep. trying to march in here, and you're checking. I up mean, they are called the colonial marines. Yeah, you are. and that yeah, was so that was very That's very purposeful. <laughs> yeah, like you're you're the force walking in. Like you're you're owed something. Like they've already made a nesting ground. Like they've got mm-hmm. the queen. They've got the they've got the shit. You're walking in on this. Like they're like you don't belong here, motherfucker. Yeah. Like we've <laughs> already set up, yep. and uh, and so they have their old way of handling stuff. And it's that it's that yep. they they know how to use their environment. They know how like things work. And so. You're not prepared for what they do. I don't know. It's some fucking clever stuff it that is. Cameron did here, and the, and you're you're taking all that away with some of these stupid shitty reviews. Letterbox. <laughs> so, well, it's not Letterbox's fault. It's just the the children. The no, I'm a, I'm a I'm a patron <laughs> of Letterbox. I just hope the reviewers <laughs> on Letterbox are listening to me. <laughs> and you guys, you guys both grew up watching this movie. Yeah, this was another yeah. Sunday afternoon. That I because I think because uh, you know. Did you I see think, this before the ever seeing? Yeah, movies? I yeah. saw this one long, multiple times before I ever saw the first one. And yeah. I think just because, I mean, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, folks making things strictly for uh, a market, you know, tar- a target market or, you know, specifically to be marketed. But I think James Cameron does, I, I think his stuff is the best of both. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's artistically head and shoulders above everybody else. It's technically above uh, everybody else. And these I feel for these characters. And, you know, uh, even though, yes, this is technically chapter two, like we get uh, we get, you know, quick flashes to kind of get caught up to speed. Yeah, really there's quickly. enough information to where if you haven't seen the first one, you, yeah. you're not lost. 
and yeah. and it, and it's and it's done in a smart way instead of like a scrolling paragraph of just right. which is just kind of lazy writing but yeah. like George Lucas fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I I I really I really enjoy this and um I I mean I I I love the first one too. Gun to my head, I think nostalgia ends up tipping the scales a little bit for me personally, but uh, you know they're both such so great and yeah i think part of the brilliance of that of this franchise is that they all do look different so there's yeah, kind of it's fun something for everybody and you know it's okay gosh you know i you know i've sat around and wasted many an hour wondering what a chris cunningham batman movie would look like hell what a michelle gondry batman movie would look like what both of those would look fucking weird yeah but you know <laughs> in what, very different much, ways yeah but how much fun like man oh, yeah. imagine imagine uh batman walks into an interrogation room and his fucking rubber johnny sitting in there <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah the, ki- so. the kids the kids listening don't know who rubber johnny is but look it up yeah <laughs> look it up. It's, it's, you'll have a nightmare <laughs> It's tough because like I think the easy reason to hate James Cameron is because of the same shit that we try to give a bunch of people like he's he the tough part is is that he knows he's like oh yeah I know how to play every fucking pentatonic scale on the guitar bum fucking ride a green day banger right now <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> like I can because <laughs> I know that's what y'all motherfuckers want to hear <laughs> I don't know, I, but I think that he genuinely has a love of genre. Uh, I really think he does. I don't. I don't think he's just because. I mean, we we talked about him growing up, like his his taste in comic books, his taste in movies. Like he, this is a he loves action movies. He loves science fiction probably more than any other genre. Like this is his wheelhouse. He's just really good at it, and he's very technically good at it. So people, I think, because his movies, especially later on, have made so much money, and things like Avatar and and Titanic, especially, were so ingrained in the cultural like conversation when they came out that oh, people yeah. got overexposed to James Cameron and now are retroactively going back and trying to shit on this. Uh, it's the same reason right. I've never seen this fucking Titanic movie. I got overexposed to Leo yeah. DiCaprio and I didn't give a shit. I didn't want to hear about him being the romantic leading dude. But uh James Cameron took uh, he, he clearly like if you know anything about him and hopefully if you're listening to this you you, you learn something about him. He clearly fucking cares like yeah. he he yeah. he is passionate about it he cares he enough to where he he takes uh, uh years and years in between movies to perfect the next thing that he's doing mm-hmm. uh you know like it's been four 13 years since avatar and <laughs> he's been working on a sequel because he cares enough to to do that now and you're telling people, yourself i don't give a shit about avatar but yeah I feel I, you know, the more we think about it, the more I'm like, God, he probably wouldn't be releasing it if it wasn't some cool shit. He's put decades of his <laughs> life into thinking about it. <laughs> you know? yeah. So you can't say that he doesn't care. Now, now going back to Alien. So one thing I do want to mention is that I think thematically the the uh, the theatrical cut does suffer a little bit when it loses the subplot about Ripley losing her daughter. Uh, because when the battle between her and the alien queen, it, it's still very thrilling in the theatrical cut. Like I told you guys, I watched both versions of it this time, uh, but it's so much more powerful that that final battle in the director's cut where those deleted scenes have been restored. They're also just really cool scenes. But uh, in, in this version, in the director's cut version, Ripley and the queen, that battle becomes a battle between two mothers. Each one I, trying I to destroy the other because of the damage that they've done to their respective families because Ripley is mourning the loss of her daughter, which is solely she didn't get a life with her daughter because of what the aliens because of her experience with the aliens, right? Yeah. Because she had to go back into hypersleep. And then Ripley burns up all of those eggs. And then and you see the, the queen screaming. Uh, it's, yep. it's an incredible sequence uh, that that confrontation between them. Uh, but that's that it becomes mom versus mom this matriarchal battle and that's that's a lot more thematically weighty i think than just kind of a revenge thing that yeah. it becomes i only the watched it in cut. The, uh the the extended cut this time and so I, I was even thinking and i didn't go you know 
cards on the table. I didn't watch the original cut or anything. So uh, that is one thing that I was watching and being like, how, how could this movie work without that? That's part of the story. I mean, it still works, but I I think, I think that does have more weight in the director's cut because, uh, because of that. And also I think the relationship between Ripley and Newt means a lot more. They do the seem to have stuff. some chemistry and uh, and poor and, Newt. And, I, I can't believe Newt hasn't done more. Like she's, no, I, I love I don't, Newt in this movie. Yeah, I don't think that kid had any interest in acting beyond this. No, uh, she became like a school teacher. I, yeah, I like, looked her yeah. up and like she, um, you know, whatever. Like she was, she was good in this movie. Yeah, but I, I will say though, I do think that overall, I think that the, the theatrical cut is a little bit of a better cut. I think it's. The, I think the pacing in the director's cuts a little bit off, uh, whereas the theatrical cut moves at a more propulsive clip. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's a much quicker uh, movie. And I think this is actually, this is funny because this is actually something that I think that we'll see come up on other Cameron films because he's released a few theatrical cuts over the years. Uh, and I find like, I, I know the abyss has a really famous one. Terminator two has a really famous one. I find all of his director's cuts fascinating. And there are scenes that are very intriguing. Some of those scenes are even like almost integral, like the ones in, in aliens, almost integral to the plot that they cut out. But I generally still enjoy the theatrical cuts better. I think that they're paced much better and they work just fine the way they are. Yeah. I mean, looking back, I I don't know that at any point I missed anything necessarily, but it does feel like I I love the matriarchal, like the, the, that whole storyline with this one. Um, I will say this. I mean, for Cameron, like, I mean, the easy part is, is that he seemed to care more about the aliens themselves, the xenomorphs, than he does about the humans. Uh, the part I love about Ridley Scott's alien, if we have to compare the two, and we don't, but I'm doing it, um, is that one of the cool things about alien is that there are actual humans, like they're, they're different variations of character in yeah. this thing and so like it does seem like james cameron's easily taken like the grunts like these are the evading force the grunts the marines like whatever you know there's there's ripley and there's these guys um uh, i could see that being a, a a thing you could take apart with sure but i mean aliens. i think i think he i think he knew what he was doing and did that somewhat on purpose though you know yeah and, and he mm. tried i mean he tried to give them all each a personality like you said like in any good war movie but there was something that felt a little different than like space truckers sure yeah like having their own personalities their own yeah. lives their own like world that they lived in uh so i i still pick alien over aliens but i don't think that james cameron would have too much of a problem with that i feel like i think he would pick alien over aliens (laughs) yeah (laughs) i appreciate that that he took he took his he did what you should do with the sequel if you're gonna do it is like try to take like the the core elements that made it successful and then build upon those like still try to make it your own don't don't fuck with like things that are you know gonna piss people off like don't make the xenomorph don't don't kill, like santa claus don't kill <laughs> um the don't kill two of the main characters from the previous movie and the before the credits roll on the on the new one that's like a bad Adventure idea <laughs> that's a bad idea um uh, one thing i gotta say watching it this time i thought because i've never seen this on the big screen and man i bet get away from her you bitch plays so great with a crowd yeah, it, it plays i sheared I cheered from my couch by myself. <laughs> and then when I watched it again, uh, my wife had just gotten home. I was like, what? She's, she's going to say it. Here it comes. <laughs> like, it's it's, it, it's such a great crowd-pleasing line. I love it. It's so good. The, I, I will say this. Uh, one of the th- quotes I saw from James Cameron that I loved is from an interview he did with the University Press of Mississippi. He said he knows this film has no, how do you, how do you put it here? Uh, no touch feel. It's all a just sound and vision, he says. Uh, but everybody knows what it feels like to have water dripping on you. So if you can create a scene that's so quiet, 
You can project yourself into it and know what it would feel like to be standing where the actor is standing, that anything that happens to the character character is in a way happening to you. Any way in which you can make a film more of a subjective experience for the audience member, the more impact it's going to have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people pay harder dollars for when they go to see a film like this, to participate in it, to have their senses affected to feel emotions. And uh, so he's going for like alien, the ride, like yeah. he's, he's, and, and it goes back to the thing I said earlier that he told Sigourney Weaver. He's like, if the first one was the fun house, this is the roller coaster. Yeah. Like, this is- he knows what he's doing, knows what he's going for. So I do want to get into a little bit of our further viewing segment. Uh, as we always do towards the end of the episode, I'm curious what you guys would pair up with aliens uh, other than alien. Uh, what other movie would you throw in as a uh, as a double feature with this one? I'll start with you, Todd. Uh, well, you know, I really dig the uh, the soldiers dealing with something that they were clearly not trained for. I, I love that because, I mean, we get, you know, for as much goofing around and everything uh, that the Marines do here in Aliens, you do get a sense that like, oh this is a tight group yeah they're well they're trained. trained yeah yeah they they can pro- they can probably handle this especially if you're thinking about the crew from the nostromo mm-hmm. they're, they're miners they're blue collar workers so yeah. yeah they didn't stand a chance these but are marines, with- not only just marines but they're on like the outer edge of the galaxy or yeah whatever yeah. the fuck they're at the solar system or whatever and just the disdain in the voice of like, is this another bug hunt? Which means like they've encountered alien lives before and dealt with them pretty easily. So it's like, okay, there's, there's a good chance. Like, you know, we're going to be okay. Like Hicks barely makes it out alive and he's yeah. the only one. <laughs> and el- only cause Sigourney saves his ass basically at the end. Yeah. Uh, that so, bug hunt line, by the way, is a, a blatant, uh, reference to Starship Troopers, the oh. book, because <laughs> because awesome. uh, I mean Cameron grew up reading that, so that's one hundred percent what he's doing there. So uh, for my further viewing, I kind of like I said, soldiers dealing with something that they clearly weren't ready for. I'm gonna go dog soldiers. That uh, was one of my picks. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I like it. And uh, gosh, it's been a while since I've seen it, but it, whenever I think about werewolves or the soldiers you know uh you know just trying to survive i always come back to dog soldiers it's yeah really great i think that's a really great a- movie um and and the, yeah that was the that was the first one that came to my mind when i was trying to think of what, what i would do on this yeah so that's a good pick gary uh i was gonna go i mean we've we've referenced this so many times i mean starship troopers would 100 be yeah. Uh, yeah. a double feature with this movie for me uh, I think that works. Uh, if I had to go out of my way and it's not any personal bias aside, I would go like pitch black. I, I knew a, exactly. Ooh. I knew exactly where you were going. Nice. <laughs> I knew exactly where you were going. Cause that was an, both, all, all three of the ones you guys have just mentioned were on my list. So I, I love that. Uh, I love that. You know, um, I love some Vin Diesel has nothing to do with him, but he <laughs> makes cinema perfection almost you know this movie is almost on par with i mean that movie would it (laughs) it would i mean it's it's a very similar structure i mean obviously very different characters and things but it's a movie i mean and and i mean this unironically uh completely that that could have and and it seems like steals directly from this movie and it does take a lot of stuff from this movie but I, i feel like it does do its own thing but yeah i mean you could say the same thing about dog soldiers. Dog soldiers is 100% like riffing on the structure of something like aliens. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. and he's just turning it into a, a, a werewolf movie, uh, which, which I guess that, that brings me to mind. So those were all on my list. Uh, one thing I was thinking about dog soldiers though, is that yeah, it's very similar to aliens, except it doesn't have like this. It's all dudes, you know, um, it doesn't have this like strong female character at the center. And that got me thinking about, uh, Neil Marshall's follow-up to the Dog Soldiers, which is the Descent, which oh, is love is nothing but women. Uh, and, and, and obviously, they're not soldiers in this in this situation. They are sp- spelunkers, but they get caught in a situation where there is a uh, indigenous species, uh, and they invade their space. 
Yep. And they get fucked up as a result, bro. That's a good one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Seriously, that's a really good one. And there's the and there's the the they're, they're like running into the aliens like caves, like yeah. the caverns yeah. that they're wandering through in this movie. Uh, totally makes sense. That's a great one. I wish I'd have thought of that one myself. And, and, uh, and my and wife even, fucking and hates it, that movie because she hates uh, the claustrophobic feeling. I was um, just about to say the claustrophobia alone is enough mm-hmm. to, to freak you out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and no, really. that's a that's a perfect one. Um, yeah. No, I would 100% say the descent would actually be dead on. That's that's the one that yeah. that like modern take on this movie that that nails it Fuck yeah and, and it's it's <laughs> but and it's obviously much more horror than this whereas this is more action oriented but it still works so when aliens was released uh fox was not doing great they desperately needed a hit we already we, we joked early on in the episode how there had been a changing of the guard several times in the early to mid 80s at fox because they kept hiring new studio heads in the hope that somebody would produce a hit uh, they were having trouble staying afloat and aliens may have single-handedly saved the studio. Uh, like th- there are people who worked for Fox at the time who are quoted saying that like this movie kept Fox from going out of business. Like this movie wow. saved Fox. Uh, so th- I mean, that, that alone is enough uh, of an accolade, but it also did wonders for Weaver's career. Uh, she had been successful before this film, you know, she had already done Ghostbusters, but after this, she became a star. Like she is a movie star after Aliens. She also became the first actor to ever be nominated for an Oscar for a science fiction film, uh, which was one of seven Academy Award nominations that the film received that year. Uh, It won two of those. It won for sound design and for special effects, which also happened to be Stan Winston's first ever Oscar win. He had been nominated, we mentioned last week, on uh, for Heartbeeps, but this is his first ever Oscar win, certainly not his last. Uh, the, the film proved that Cameron was not only talented, but could work within the confines of a Hollywood studio, even if he sometimes butted head with you know, some of the suits. Although the film fell behind during the post-production schedule, uh, it ended, ended up being finished on time. And almost on budget, uh, at $18 million, it ended up being about $2 million over the original planned cost. So it kind of proved that he could deliver a movie on time, even if it was uh, a photo finish to get it there. Uh, I love did- talking about movies where we're just like, hey, you, you just went over by like $2 million. Hey, and in movie terms, that's not too bad. <laughs> um, but if, if the Terminator had guaranteed Cameron a spot at the Hollywood table, then Aliens put him pretty near the head of that table. Uh, nice. And with his newfound power, he would actually, you know, just like after the Terminator, but even more so with Aliens, he had the ability to do whatever he wanted to do. Uh, and he would choose... His next project, he, he would do a film that he had actually wanted to make ever since he was a teenager. This was a, a, an idea that he had had for decades. Uh, and that's the film we're going to be talking about on the next episode of Cinema Shock. We're going forward a couple years in time to James Cameron's The Abyss. Piranha 3. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're no, talking the about Abyss. The Abyss. Oh, man, it's, uh, it's been years since I've seen it. It is... Of all the James Cameron movies we're talking about, one of the hardest to find for some reason. Um, It's hard to find streaming. It's never been released on Blu-ray. There has been a 4K restoration in the work for what seems like years at this point. Uh, But yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why this movie is so hard to find, but it it is um, for such a big budget movie. But uh, hopefully, we. I mean, I own it. So hopefully you guys can narrow it down. Otherwise, we might be having a movie night. Hey. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> That'd be between, fun. It's, it's uh looking at just watch right now it's streaming on stars okay okay <laughs> and then and, and that's about it <laughs> so wow. uh i guess you, you can do can a star special a edition trial. on on prime for like 12 bucks so uh like, like a order. digital no the dvd no. dvd yeah. yeah the dvd yeah you can get the vhs for 948 oh i might buy that <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, oh, yeah I, if you do the if you do the additional options like the you know the used you can do it for like less than 10 so there you go so it's out there the uh, it's just you just can't stream it you're gonna have to unless you have stars you're gonna have to find it hopefully down the line that won't be the case uh so anyway 
that's it for this episode. We'll be returning in a couple of weeks with, uh, with our discussion on the abyss. Uh, you guys follow along with us. Uh, you can stream the movie if you can find it. Uh, uh, maybe if you're listening to this episode a couple years down the line, it, it'll be more readily available. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but anyway, where can you guys be found on the internet for our listeners to follow you? At This is Gary Horde on all the social medias. Come follow me. And if you like all of uh, my nonsense about Star Trek, then you should definitely check out my show, Computer Resume Podcast, where we cover the entire Star Trek franchise in chronological order. Uh, available now wherever you get your podcasts on all the social medias at Computer Resume. And you can find me at Mr. Todd A. Davis on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and D&D Beyond. <laughs> and I am at Justin underscore Bishop, Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox. Uh, you can also find the show at cinema underscore shock. That's on Twitter and Instagram. We're also on Facebook. We're also on discord, uh, which you can find a link to that on our website, cinemashock.net, which we just kind of, I relaunched and I've got all the episodes up now. Everything's on there. Uh, I've still got some little goodies that I'm probably working on, but for the most part, everything you want is on there, including links to like every episode that we've ever done. Uh, and our merchandise that we, uh, we were selling a pride t-shirt right now through our thread list where hundred percent of the profits that we would normally make are going to the Trevor project. So, uh, go Yay. check that out. Uh, we've sold a few of those already this month. So, but, but that's available year round. It's not just a pride month thing. We always keep that thing up there. So it's always available. It's our little Scully logo but with the pride flag behind it. It's very fun, but we've got also t-shirts with like all of our catchphrases with just the logo, uh, whatever you want. It's all on there with all kinds of like color options and everything so check that out if you want we don't really make any money off of them we just like the idea that people uh are fans of the show enough to wear a t-shirt <laughs> so <laughs> uh you can also find us on all the regular podcatchers go rate and review if you're using especially if you're using uh, apple podcasts or spotify where you can rate and review now or you can at least rate on spotify now and uh i guess most importantly just share this with your friends you know, if they're into movies, if they're into James Cameron or sci-fi or alien, the alien franchise or whatever, and you think they'd be interested, you know, send them a little DM, send them a text and send them a link to this episode. I guess that's all I got, guys. That's all my bullshit. That's all the end of the end of the episode <laughs> bullshit. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, we, we rely on you guys. You got to tell people about us. Word we, of mouth, man. On you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we could do all, we can do all the Google research and bullshit that we want, but it, word of mouth is what gets it out there. Honestly. Uh, so please tell somebody uh, we would love that and uh, drop us a line on the social media. We're, we're pretty good at, uh, yeah. Talk to us at, at interacting <laughs> with folks. So it's, tell it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a lot of fun for us. Tell us uh, where you think we're wrong. Yeah. Tell we're... Todd why he's so fucking <laughs> stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't mean that Todd. I yeah, love uh, Todd. So we much. love Todd. Everyone loves Todd. Uh, Todd's, Todd's lovable. He's the most he's the most lovable person on this podcast, honestly. That is 100% accurate. Yeah. That's, that's very sweet of you. That might be the sweetest not thing. Without, not without without our editing, but yes. <laughs> yeah, we have to edit some of his more Todd problematic. Todd would have been long ago canceled. It's not for us, but we're we help him. him. We help we're him to... and he becomes the most popular. We're we're just we're chalking that up to naivety. So we're done. We're just... <laughs> anyway, until next time. May the wings of liberty never lose a feather. And be excellent to each other. He figured that if he could get us the keys back through quarantine, if one of us was impregnated and then frozen for the trip home, nobody would know about the keys we were carrying, me and Johnny. <laughs> That's all I got, <laughs> fellas. <laughs> oh, I mean... I don't know where what else you would have done, honestly. Yeah, I know. I was That's I searched a for a long that. time for a decent one. I was just like, <laughs> I guess I'll go with the impregnated one, but yeah, yeah. Do it. Impregnated one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>